Welcome to the Endurance Studio Podcast. I'm your host, Dylan Turner. I'm an avid ultra-endurance cyclist, bikepacker, and runner, and I'm on a journey to learn and share everything I can about how people can push beyond their limits. This podcast will explore all aspects of endurance through conversations with people I find unique and interesting. There's always an amazing story of accomplishment and failure, and always something to learn. run this podcast from an off-grid mobile studio I've created so I can travel to the guests and have authentic in-person conversations because I believe in the importance and power of face-to-face conversations. This costs money to run and you can support this podcast by becoming a sustaining member, liking, subscribing, commenting, and most importantly, sharing with your friends and family. If you're interested in advertising on the podcast, please contact me at theenduranceStudio at gmail.com. Thank you for watching and listening. Before we jump into the podcast, I want to mention a few companies that make products that I just think are incredible and I can't stop talking about. Uh, the first one is Squirrel's Nut Butter. I did a podcast with Chris Thornley, the co-founder. It was incredible to learn more about the company and his background. Um, so they make a uh, all kinds of different uh, lubes for chafing and uh, w- when running and bikepacking. Uh, so go check them out, squirrelsnutbutter.com. I do have a, a promo code. It's Timber Friends, T I M B E R F R I E N D S, Timber Friends, for ten percent off, and squirrelsnutbutter.com. And the other company is also here in Flagstaff. Uh, it's Catula. They make uh, gaiters and running traction. And I've recently discovered how incredible the running traction is. And I've been using the gaiters for a really long time. Um, and they're just really great people, amazing company, and they're always making better and better products. So go check them out, katula.com. And the last one is Dispersed Bikepacking Gear. Uh, this is Katie and Andrew Strimke. They make their own bags, uh, bikepacking bags, and they just make incredible stuff. Uh, they're both super accomplished bikepackers. And Andrew has completed the Triple Crown. That's the Colorado Trail Race, Arizona Trail Race, and Tour Divide all in one year, all on a single speed. So I'm going to buy my bags from a person who has gone through the bikepacking gauntlet uh, if I'm going to buy bikepacking bags. So go check them out, dispersed.bike. And last thing before we jump into the podcast, I want to let you know a couple new ways that you can financially support this podcast. It is uh, very expensive to run this and to travel to the guests so that I can have in-person, face-to-face conversations, but um, it's uh, really amazing to capture these so far, and I I want to keep this going. So um, there's a couple ways you can support uh, in addition to liking, subscribing, and sharing with your friends. Uh, you can become a member on the YouTube channel. It's $2.99 a month. You'll get uh, loyalty badges next to your name in comments and live chats. You'll get early access to new videos. Uh, you'll get member shout outs and you'll get priority reply to comments. So becoming a recurring member uh, would just be incredible to help uh, support this podcast. And then the other way, if you don't want to sign up for the recurring uh, monthly subscription, you can uh, on also on YouTube, you can make a one-time donation using a super sticker. Small amount or large amount, anything uh, is, is really amazing to help keeping this ship sailing. So appreciate it. I appreciate all in advance uh, for everyone who has supported. And um, yeah, thanks for watching and listening and let's uh, jump into the podcast. Today's podcast features a good friend and a man I consider the big brother that I never had, Dana Ernst. Soon, we're both attempting the Verde Valley Randonnée. It's a 250-mile, 400-kilometer mixed-terrain ramble through the Verde Valley in northern Arizona. Uh, In today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the VVR, looking at what we've learned from our past finishes, general strategy, and answer some questions we've received from fans. So I hope you enjoy, and let's jump in. Let's get to the name. The name. Verde Valley Randonnée. That's correct. Is that how Americans say it? Um, With the hard R? That's a really good question. Uh, I have some good friends who do a lot of brevet slash randonneering events, and that's how they say it. And they go to France and do things like Paris, Brest, Paris. 
And so I'm going to trust them. Brevet, that, I mean, that's a French word. Yeah. It's B-R-E-V-E-T. That's correct. So yeah. it's in, you know, so like America would say brevet, right? Brevet. It's a brevet. 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 But it is not a brevet. It's a brevet. brevet. So I think Rendonne is correct. Uh, oh, I mean, correct. That's probably not the French pronunciation, but that's how I think it's acceptable to say in the United States. I pulled it up. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look. Because I, uh, here, let's play it. Yeah. Here's how they say it. Randonne. Randonne. So you got to get that like fl- phlegm going. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, we don't even say Paris correctly. <laughs> P- Paris, right? Paris, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't so, know any French. So I think <clears throat> Randonnet. Let's go is, with it. Is, is, <laughs> I think it's acceptable. I yeah. haven't eaten enough like caramellos <laughs> to get into my throat <laughs> to say it yeah. the French way. <laughs> I do every time I type it. I constantly can't remember where the accent goes and which way it points, but now I've typed it enough that it auto-completes. Now I don't have to think about it anymore. Okay. It's the last E to the right, right? Correct, yeah. From the yeah. bottom to the right. Yeah, and probably everybody knows that, but I type enough random things in mathematics where the accents are check or something like that, where the accents go every which way, so I'm all discombobulated with my accents. Probably <laughs> nobody would hesitate if they were going to write a French word with an accent, which way it would be pointing, but I get confused. Right, Yeah. right. So... I kind of came on to the, the VVR. I'm just, I'm just going to call it the VVR. It's much easier for me yep. <laughs> uh, moving forward. I kind of came on to it at, like, after you had developed it and uh, published it and kind of put it out for the world. I want to go back a little bit because I never really asked you, you know, what were the origins of it? Why did you decide to do this? Um, and when, when did you kind of start like planning this thing? I don't think I remember the specific dates, but I kind of know roughly what happened. So pre-COVID, we were having a relatively mild winter and I random, as I do with people, I randomly texted Joe Pavlik and I was like, let's ride 200 miles between Christmas and New Year's in one shot. And he's like, okay. And so I doodled a route together, which ended up being sort of the backbone for the Verde Valley Randonnée VVR. Um, so that was kind of like the initial sort of drafting of the route. And it was exactly 200 miles. And <laughs> it was, even though it was a mild winter, we were able to ride everything, but it got quite cold. We actually ended up not finishing. I think we made it in maybe 170 miles or so. And then my wife came and picked us up. It was freezing. And part of the issue was I had stashed a cooler with some water and food in it. And I thought it was in a totally safe spot and someone had found it and dumped everything out and stole it. So that was part of our motivation. Like we didn't have the food and water that in the resupply was like at this near the Mormon Lake exit. Sorry, Stoneman Lake exit. That's where the cooler was. Yes. I've got bad experiences. Yeah, that's like a cursed spot for 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 me. You you, car almost got broken into there also. Yeah. Yeah. Not too long ago. So it's because it's right off the highway. It's like accessible, right? That the spot where the cooler was is like kind of in a, hidden secluded spot in the bushes like i don't even know how anyone saw it but they definitely it wasn't like an animal like people went in there and they took everything yeah and then like emptied all the wrappers and cans and dumped everything so we didn't have the food and water that we wanted and we were both completely freezing and we're like oh we made it pretty damn far for winter time and we called it and then and that was it so that was kind of like the initial sort of idea was that that like 200 mile route and then Around the same time, I had done, actually with Joe again, my first Brevet event. So they're in Arizona. There's a Brevet series, which is these randoneering events where you get together with like-minded people and you start together and follow a prescribed route. They're almost always road routes, all on the road, road bikes. And they're like these prescriptive distances. You could have a 100K or a 200K or a 300K or a 400K or a 600K or a 1200K. And there's this like a brevet series and you'd have to complete a series in order to like qualify for something like Paris, Brest, Paris, which is like the Olympics of the randoneering that's in France every four years. I think it's the oldest, longest running cycling event in the world. And so around that same time, I had done this randoneering event and they're, they're not meant to be competitive. They're meant to be like these challenges that you complete on your own. Um, but you're allowed to draft and, uh, you know, use common resupply points. Um, but it's not a race. So people can kind of go at whatever pace they want. Some people like to challenge themselves and go as fast as possible. But like when they record the 
finishes is just like who finished what was your time and there's no no discussion whatsoever about who was first or whatever they're not meant to be competitive things they're just challenges that are increasing in difficulty based on the duration so around that same time i had done one of those and i just kind of like merged the two ideas together i was like oh well I could add a little bit here and make it exactly a 400K and make it a sort of gravel oriented sort of randoneering type event. Um, so it's kind of a blending of endurance bikepacking uh, ethos and spirit mixed together with sort of the brevet slash randoneering sort of style of things. And that's kind of how it came to be. Yeah. And, and there's, so there's not really uh, grand departs in randoneering. So there's, I'm going to probably misspeak. Someone who's totally into randoneering is going to probably say that I said this incorrectly, but there's kind of roughly speaking two types of events. You can have like a grand depart style event where you all start together. Yeah. Uh, but there's also things called permanence, which are these designated routes that you can just go do whenever you want. And then you have to submit some sort of uh, proof that you proof of passage is what it's called that you actually completed the route. In the old days, it was like a receipt at various gas stations or pictures and nowadays you can do an electronic proof of passage, which is like a, here's my Strava file or my ride with GPS. File. Right. And you can get credit for completing these permanents. And so currently VVR is now designated as a RUSA permanent. RUSA is the randoneering, randoneers of the USA. Right. Yeah. So, and that's kind of what got me interested in thinking about today was uh, a guy reached out to me, Robert Anderson, with a bunch of questions. And he brought up the RUSA thing and he had i don't know how he got a hold of me through like through the stuff i did on instagram and posted or something like that that he saw i did it so he was asking me questions because he really a lot of these questions i i think sh should have been directed at you and that's what inspired this yeah, but right you're the, you're the youtube guy i guess so <laughs> so i'm the information hub yeah but um but in he he brought up the rusa thing and i was like i don't even know what this is and then he said something about getting credit for it and doing a certain amount of races and that's um that he's doing he's he's working towards certain races by getting credit and yeah uh, yeah. events they're not official ra races yeah. yeah we do races in bike packing but in the randoneering world it's somewhat faux pas to say race okay guess, yeah yeah but people definitely go fast when they want to but that's not everybody's sort of goal yeah i mean i'm going as fast as possible yeah on and the i like VVR. to too yeah, yeah. But there's also, I think, I don't know if anybody's tried it. There's only been a handful of people that have attempted it. Yeah, I actually looked today. I think there's been six finishers, um, stick, six distinct people, and you're the only one that's done the full route twice, as far as I know. Right. And no one's done it since it had the RUSA designation, which just happened maybe a couple months ago. Okay. And did you have to like submit it, like uh, submit an application? Yeah, I had to submit an application and submit the ride with GPS file. And then there was like pretty strict requirements about making sure that the the cues were accurate. Like when I do ride with GPS, I just like let it auto make cues and then I just ignore them or delete them. Yeah. But for RUSA routes for permanence, you you have like really detailed cues, like turn at this mile, turn at this mile. Here's where the, um, just totally drew a blank. The uh, POIs are, I'm going to say, um, points of interest yeah. on, on route. You need to specify exactly where they are. I see. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. And so that's kind of where the photo thing came from too. Like, yeah, that was, that was kind of like the old school sort of like randoneering style thing. Like you needed yeah. proof of passage and it used to be like receipts at gas stations or a store saying I was here. Right. Or a photo. And so that's kind of yeah, that. So a, a thing I have in there, which I probably wouldn't ever really enforce is can you, you know, take a photo at these designated spots. Right. I thought it was cool. Like yeah. it's coming from the mountain biking world that had never done anything like this or had any idea. It was like, Oh, this is a fun thing that yeah. we have to do. And I kind of also thought it would be neat to have like people, a collection of photos over time where everybody had taken a photo in the same spots. Mm -hmm. And then you have like this collage of like, Oh, here's, here's all the photos where people took it at the Verde bridge. And yeah, the bridge is classic. Like yeah. if you had a, like, um, uh, uh, a, a, a mosaic of everyone, at the bridge. Yeah. You know, that'd so, be so we don't cool. have too many of those at the moment because there's been so few people to do it. But yeah, that was kind of my motivation. It'd be kind of neat to have like, oh, everybody took a photo in the same spot. Let's see what they did. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the 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 route a little bit, just the route itself. So it's and I wrote down some of the stats on here. I'm not sure how accurate they are. It's the ride with GPS stuff. So it's 
248 miles or 250 miles ish give or take yep um it's about 17,000 on ride with gps it's 17,287 feet of climbing yeah and i think that's probably a little under what reality is yeah i can't I think, remember what my last yeah. one was but it seemed like it was in the tw- maybe the 18 to 20 range yep it was i looked back at it and it's and i'm like wow that's a lot of climbing for 24 hours or 25 hours <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and you're using it's on your website yep. right uh which is we'll just shout that out now um i have it somewhere here on my notes i could tell you yeah tell me please it's dana ernst.com my vanity website <laughs> slash verde valley randonne there's two ends on the end and two e's on the end no accent and the v the v and the r are capitalized so Dana Ernst.com slash Verde Valley Randon A, capital V, capital R, capital R. And we'll put the link in the description too on on this. Um, so I like I want I want to see more, more people attempt this. Like we, we tried to organize a grand apart, a loose grand apart last spring or yep. last fall. And, and, and I was the only one. You were the only up. one that did it. Yeah. I mean we, we didn't try too hard. Uh, right. Yeah. But you have an Instagram for it. Yep. Don't use it too often, but yeah. But people can check out the Instagram or uh, follow it to um, get updates on if we're going to be doing anything. Or I think you posted like live updates. Yeah, I think when you did it last, I posted updates when you had posted things, at least maybe the second to last time. And then when I did it, I sort of posted things along the way. And if anyone else is out there doing stuff, yeah. So it's a giant loop. It starts in Flagstaff. That's traditionally how I've done it. But the way that I've sort of set things up as a challenge, you could start the loop in any spot you wanted to. So you just have to complete the loop starting anywhere you want and you can go clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, Everybody that's finished it has gone counterclockwise, correct? Right. Yes. Yes, (laughs) counterclockwise. Um, Joe Pavlik and Daniel Dickinson did attempt it uh, a year or two ago going clockwise. Um, Then I don't remember the circumstances for why they ended up bailing. It wasn't because that direction is too hard. I think there were some other circumstances, but... Um, I, I think it would be excellent in both directions, but no one's no one's yet done it in the clockwise direction. Yeah, it's on my list after I achieve my goal of under 24 hours on counterclockwise. Like that's just the one thing I want Yeah, is to get under that 24 hour mark because I almost had it last time. You would have had it. And um, <laughs> I was at, so I, I was heading down Perkinsville Road, bombing down ahead of schedule, like determined to do to do this right and you know these things like the best laid plans get derailed right and i got down i hit the dirt because you're you're flying down and you're losing all this elevation you're heading towards the verde river and you're on road and it's just like wonderful right it's just you're just feeling so good such a beautiful section because you can actually like it's steep enough that you pedaling is pointless and you're just bombing down coasting and you can kind of just tune out and look around. It's gorgeous. And it's, there's not very many cars. Yeah. It's, it, I was there on a weekend. It was a, it was a Saturday, I think. And there was like no cars. So, so you basically headed out of flag over to Williams, Arizona West, and then like historic Williams and then South on Perkinsville road that takes you down to the Verde river. And that's like, for me, the first big milestone right? The first big waypoint. And I'm, I think it was like noon or something, some, something like that. And I started at 5 AM and then, and then I hit the situation, which was a like rally car race, like a Subaru, like Subarus and stuff doing like a rally car race. They have an annual thing there apparently. And they got, um, the permission to close the road while they did like two laps on this rally car race. And they were like not interested. They were like not having us. Yep. Like, cause us, by us, I mean like I got down there and the guy turned me, basically turned me around and I called you and I said, well, this sucks. Yeah. You were, <laughs> you were way ahead of schedule cause I was following your dot and I was like, he is absolutely crushing. Yeah. I was feeling good. Yeah. And then, and then it was just like deflated. Right. And they're like, sorry. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Just like ride back up this giant hill that I just bombed down. That's my choice. Right. So I just, I was actually practicing my bikepacking skill of like giving myself some space and some time. And like when things go wrong, don't like, don't like try to find a solution right away. Like sometimes you just got to like chill out and 
let let it let it kind of work itself out a little bit right and these other bike packers showed up so like this is a perfect example of that working in my favor right these other two bike packers showed up and they were doing a big loop that like went through prescott and came around i don't know the exact name of the loop i think they were doing the yavapai backcountry route that craig yeah. put together perhaps yeah that's it yep and so they were also like needing to get through and they had a B, uh, airbnb in jerome which is after perkinsville road you get up so they basically like were gonna miss their it was gonna royally screw their plans up also so the three of us like get together and one of these guys was was kind of was kind of getting real ma- angry and trying to take the mad the mean guy approach and that that would the the race director for the um for the rally race that guy was just not having it they were like go talk to the guy in the cowboy hat <laughs> and we're just like and the guy in the cowboy hat could care less about us right um so we finally like we calmed that guy down and they were they were brothers i think and the the other brother was i was like hey we should like try and take like the diplomatic approach on this like let's see if we can like get to the right person and just be like you know talk talk to him and kind of wear him down a little bit so we finally worked our way through uh and we it, half the battle was figuring out like who to talk to who's the right person who was in charge that could let right. us through and so i don't know like two hours went by something maybe an hour and a half i did look back on my tracker and it was maybe like an hour and a half of us just like sitting there waiting to try and find the right person. And we finally got to the right guy. And the guy said, okay, you guys, he basically was like, I think annoyed by us. Cause we like, we weren't given up. Right. We took that approach. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, he said, there's two, there, we do two laps here and then there's a break. There's a window in between. So after the last car leaves the course, so like turns right after the Verde basically and goes over out to Chino Valley. After the last car clears, there those cars are going to go and have lunch and like do this memorial thing in Chino Valley, and then they're going to come back around and we're going to do a second lap. So you guys have a like a twenty minute window after that last car leaves before the first car is back from the memorial lunch to get through this spot. And we're like, that's fine, no problem. We can make it through in 20 minutes, which was a lie. It's like 45 minutes, but we were like, yeah, you could do it. Yeah, we'll do this. Don't worry. We got it. Right. And so I like you are on the north side of the bridge at this point. Yeah. Had you planned on stopping and filtering water at the bridge? Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't have time for that. So I had to make a like, you know, fast decision at that moment because I like. I was all in a hurry. I was afraid I was going to get kicked off the course if I didn't go, didn't go fast enough. So I just like get on the gas and just like haul through this section and I hit the bridge and I run down to the water and I fill up and I fill up like just enough to, to, to what I thought was just enough to get me up through that climb to Jerome, Yeah, which that's like a really, it was, it was going to be really hot and that's just a really, and it's just getting hotter because as you're sitting there waiting. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, I think I got like one liter of water maybe quickly and then ran back to my bike and got back on it. And I was like in like cross country race mode, you know, just like dumping adrenaline. Yeah. Like, like it was, it was not good. And Cause then, you want, you wanted to break 24 hours. You were ahead of schedule and now you're burning precious time in your mind. Yeah. But I pretty much figured at that point I was not going to break the 24 hours. So, so I was kind of free of that obligation at that point i was like well um i'm just gonna ride how i want to ride now because i'm probably not going to do it It was defeating it first and then i realized it was kind of freeing after that it was like all right and um but but i i dumped so much energy on that on crossing through the course that after i got through it and started climbing up to jerome i got like horribly sick like (laughs) digestive sick like i had the rhea like horribly bad yeah and i was just like completely like toast like fried on the way up i mean it was horrible pinning it for a while during a long effort like that is not a good combination dude because because i had just dumped all that like i had gone really fast from flagstaff to like the descent and then i just like chilled out on the descent Right. And then I just sat around like nervously waiting for two, like an hour and a half and then jumped on the bike and rode as fast as possible for 45 minutes. Right. In, into the hottest part of the route. Yeah. And then, then did the climb, then started the climb. So my body just like rejected all that yeah. at that point. And, and I, that, I mean, it was that horrible. climb, which we've used in a couple versions of pinions and pines is, is long and hard and hot. Yeah. And often a headwind. Yeah. 
yeah, it's 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 beautiful when you get up high enough, like as you start to crest up into Jerome. But then the other thing too, is there's all these false summits on it. Mm -hmm. Like you keep thinking you're at the top and yeah. then it, you come around a corner and there's another false summit. I've done summit. it enough now that I kind of like, yeah, the false summits don't exist for me anymore. Right. It's kind of like, oh, I get to go down here for 30 seconds. It's kind of nice. Right. Yeah. I, I think that is one of the most beautiful sections of riding in the entire state. Uh, yeah. Agreed. When you look backwards. Coming down to the Verde, just bombing down on the pavement, smooth, look around. It's just gorgeous. And you can see where you're about to go and then you cross the Verde and then you start climbing up. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not single track, so which is, you know, ideal in my mind. But like, as far as like riding a bicycle in a beautiful place in the state and challenging terrain, I, I don't, it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. Yeah. And the trap, the traffic's not bad. And like, I don't think there's a lot of, I don't remember a lot of side-by-sides on it. No, I, I've been pretty lucky on that. Yeah. Yeah. We, maybe we shouldn't say how awesome it is to the wrong audience, but. It just doesn't seem like there's a, that's a real, uh, super highway for side-by-sides between, yeah. the, between Jerome and. I, I will say in case this doesn't come up later, I was out on a long ride last weekend and my plan was to do a loop around the Mingus and then go down to the Verde and back and it. I went down there because we had, it had recently snowed here and I knew it had kind of gotten wet up there. And the first, I don't know, 50 miles of my ride that day were actually pretty good. And then I started climbing out of Jerome before you dropped down to the Verde. It started getting muddy. Yeah. And then more muddy. And then I, it was like show stopping mud, which is the first time I'd been on it when it had been wet. So yeah. for anybody who's about to go do that route, I think that section of that climb at some point, the soil is show-stopping mud to Jerome if you're going counterclockwise. So that's not a section you want to do when it's wet. Yeah. It's usually not. It's dry. It's a desert. But I had to turn around and like hike my bike back. Yikes. So we're doing it in two, like, I don't know, 10 days or something. Mm -hmm. Should be fine. You think? It'll be dry I, now? It's probably dry right now. Yeah. I think it was just like just bad timing. If I had been there a little earlier, probably. No, I mean been... like all the rest of the course, like all the Northern Arizona stuff. That's a good question. I don't know. I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that that's fine and dusty by now, but yeah. that bit, but the, I'm, I'm thinking like the stuff that's right outside of flag at the beginning. Cause at the end it's mostly pavement. Well, I guess there's the part that comes in behind Lake Mary, mm -hmm. which that I could get a little dicey, but it's probably not that bad. I think it would, you know, it wouldn't be enjoyable, but it wouldn't be like a death mud show stopping. Right. Like you could ride through it and it'd be mucky and you'd get dirty, but it wouldn't be like you couldn't continue. Right. But that other mud was like, oh, this is, this is the mud that you could, you know, you could get lost out here. <laughs> yeah. I was in some of that on a mountain bike. <laughs> yeah. Last week and, and that was a bad decision. Yeah. And now I have a fork that I need to fix. Yep. But so it still yeah. hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did get some intel from Jessica, my wife. She said that she was up on the Mesa the other day. You know, the road that on VVR, you climb up out and there's that long road that goes up on the Mesa. Yep. She said that that's just like horribly rutted out because of logging, because all the logging trucks drove in there mm. when it was all muddy. I've toyed with the idea of actually rerouting that section specifically because of that Tunnel Springs road being all screwed up either from people driving Jeeps or razors on it after it's muddy because it's not a regularly maintained road. And then it just gets screwed up for years. Yeah. Uh, or now for the logging. So that's, that, that's a section when if it's running good, it's beautiful up there, but it can kind of be annoying. I mean, thankfully it's, it's early on. So you're, you're not totally destroyed and it's not that long. That's probably actually my least favorite part of the route, especially because it's so close to home. I do it all the time. And if the road's in bad shape, then yeah, it's kind of not, not amazing. Yeah. There's other alternatives. I was just trying to get it off pavement as much as possible, but there's maybe we, yeah, maybe we reroute things right there. Yeah. Maybe not for this time. Yeah. Maybe for the future. So, all right. So anyway, back to the, if I have to comprehensively lay out the route, it basically goes from Flagstaff to Williams down to the Verde up to Jerome. Um, up, 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 up to Jerome. And then up, 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 <laughs> on a pavement road out of Jerome up to kind of like a saddle at Mingus. Yep. It, you're almost basically at the top of Mingus. You're really close elevation wise. It's there's some sort of summer camp or something up there or like yep. a and Mingus you're near, camp. You're near a campground, which I've actually never detoured to go check out, but it's 
It's just to the south, uh, north from where the route and, goes. And I remember seeing like an elevation sign at that saddle and you're back at like 7,000 feet or something. You're back at like 7-1 or something like that. Right. And that's the elevation of Flagstaff. So yeah, on the right. southernmost part of the route, you actually climb up to the elevation that you started at. Right. Yeah. Which is just wild. And then you get the part that kind of lives in lore for me is the the descent down Mingus because it's always getting dark for me and I'm starting to fatigue heavily. Let's let's be let's be clear here though. There's a lot of riding to do between the top of Mingus and that descent. Right. It's up and down, up and down. That I think, you know, we in our mind we think, oh, I'm just gonna climb up the top of Mingus and then I'm gonna bomb down to Cherry. Right. But you gotta do all that up and down along the ridge line, which I think is actually some of the hardest riding on the route because it's pretty steep. It's probably one of the only spots people may have to get off and walk for a couple of seconds. Yeah. There's some little steep pitches and it's like up and down, up and down along these beautiful ridge lines, sometimes with fantastic views. And then you get to the infamous descent. Yeah. I, I maybe I missed some of that part because that all seemed to be one thing for me is like from the saddle to Cherry Creek Road. Okay. I feel like you gotta <laughs> climb before you go down. Oh okay. up and down, up and down. And then you can do the pretty gnarly descent. Like the chunkiest part of the route by far. Yep. Right? Is is that backside of Mingus where you're going down yeah. to Cherry Creek Road. But the traverse to get from the summit of Mingus to that chunky part, there's, there's got to be a couple thousand feet, well, I don't know, a thousand feet of climbing in there just packed into a short distance. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I, the trauma from the chunky stuff, like, yeah, yeah, put yeah. that out of my mind. Cause I, I so yeah. I think that's always huh. a low point for me. I think it's beautiful. It's one another, it's probably my second favorite part of the route is that sort of like from the summit of Mingus over to that chunky descent. Oh, you're remembering now. Yeah. You go by a little s- short section of private property. I I think, I don't know. Then you're Man. on the great Western ride. These right thing. Like <laughs> you've done it twice. I know, but it was dark once. Look, when I, do, Oh, and pinions like, and pines. After these 20, like after these efforts where you're doing like 26 hours and not really sleeping, like things just like delete from my memory. Yeah. Like chunks of stuff just delete from my memory. Like it happened on Stagecoach too. Yeah. Like an entire half of a day deleted from my memory on that. Yeah. I'm not sure. Does that happen to you? Yeah, absolutely. Some, well, things, some things just stand out, but definitely other things. It's interesting. Either get deleted or I can't quite remember what order things happened in. Right. Yeah. Because like, your mind's like kind of altered at that that point. So it doesn't, yeah, you're not really processing information the same way. So you're not going to store the memory the same way. Yeah. And you're going to store it differently than I'm going to store it based yeah. off of the factors that like stand yeah, out to so you. Yeah. Right? So the, the several times that I've ridden that section, either in Pinion the Pines or just out for long day rides or during VVR, that section is like, has been low points for me in the past. Yeah. Interesting. I'll have yeah. to well, remember maybe... to look at it this time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's... I think it's really special. The first time I was ever up there, Artek Durham and I rode it. And I was just like, wow, how did I not know this was here? I'd lived in Flagstaff for years before I ever rode that thing. Yeah. I have a map. I brought, I printed the map out, yeah. but it's not going to help very much. It's it's a longer stretch than you think. I mean, we should, we should, we could probably quote that mileage, but I don't, yeah. certainly don't have it memorized, but. All right. And this is, this is after the saddle. I'm not going to linger on this for too much longer, yeah. but this is after the saddle and before the chunky descent starts to Cherry Creek Road. I remember like going up a road and kind of like a, a big road and then you hit the dirt at the top. The paved road. You go up the paved road. Yeah, which is harder than you think. You're yeah. like, oh, I'm almost there. And then you're like, it's holy crap, it's hard. Graded, right? And it kind of goes back in yep. off the main road. And then you hit the the dirt on top where there's kind of all the campers around, like people camping mm-hmm. on the top of Mingus around. Yep. And yeah. that's... At that point, I'm getting like the smells of campfires and starting to like get real. Yeah. Going into that first night of um, that like preservation instinct of like you should get into a safe space. Yeah. You know, like so you don't get eaten by the animals and you smell the campfires and mm-hmm. you see the people like sitting around the campfires having drinks and stuff. And you, you know that you're about to go into the depths of of this thing. Yeah. This is just the beginning of it, you know? Yeah. And you, you pretty quickly go from seeing all those people near that paved climb to kind of feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Real quickly. You, you can see nothing. There's no lights in the distance. Yes. Yep. And it's super chunky. After a little while, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole stretch is kind of chunky. It's definitely the roughest part of the route, but the, the, the chunk part that we're referring to is that the descent off the ridge line down to the town of Cherry before you hit Cherry Road. 
Now, are there other uh, events, Rusa events that have sections that are like chunky like that? Rusa only recently has branched into gravel type routes. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's all based in road, right? Like French road Traditionally, it's, you know, paved, paved roads, road bikes. And now it's like a mix of gravel and pavement i would I, I don't know what number of routes are actually permanents that are gravel but i'd probably guess that most of them are like you know 80 to 90 percent pavement in a little cool section of dirt whereas yeah. this route's like as much dirt as possible linking together with some pavement that's pretty good to ride on you know not too many cars so th- this is mostly dirt and so that's probably a departure from most rusa gravel type um routes yeah, it's got that like added Dana spice to it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's got I mean, that like merging of bike packing and and random yeah. is what it seems like. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I my goal with the route was try and create a beautiful loop that takes in all these cool aspects. I mean, the the biomes that you go through and the elevation changes on this route are pretty spectacular. Yeah, they're incredible. And I definitely was trying to avoid any you know bullshit miles. Yeah, some of those sections. Getting to the top of Mingus are are beautiful, and you kind of do have to put up with one pretty chunky descent. Like if someone's on a gravel bike, they're probably gonna, you know, be like, "What the fuck?" I was, yeah, um, for but, sure. You know, it's a few miles long. It's doable. Um, it's not going to be everybody's favorite, but it's kind of like there's no other way through. Right. It wasn't like I just tried to put some stupid section and it was like, "Well, how am I going to incorporate all this cool stuff and get from A to B?" Okay, I, I, we have to use this road, right? Um, and thankfully it's, you know, it's a, it's a three mile stretch of a 250 mile route. Yeah. And you know, there's a couple of their little short sections of chunkiness here, but that's, that's by far the chunkiest and everything else I think, in my opinion, is pretty damn good on a gravel bike. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So then it, then it hits Cherry Creek road. There's an amazing descent, <sighs> incredible descent. So, like so good. You could go, I, I I've got, I've get I trying to get the words out here. Cause I remember I'm flashing back. I, I get going so fast on that descent that some of those corners get a little dicey. <laughs> yeah, because it's a it's a smoothish, mostly smooth, pretty dirt road, but it's it you know it's it's powdery. So if if you're trying to go around a corner too fast and someone from a decreasing radius, it it'd be pretty easy to you know be kind of, kind of wash out on a corner. Yeah, get a it's little. A good, it's a good road, but it's it's fast and mostly smooth, but a little bit dusty. So right, you could you could eat shit. And I don't you, I don't know anyone who has, but you got to pay attention. For sure, yeah, and there's also fair amount of traffic once you get into the, the there's not a bunch of traffic but cherry has residents and they have yeah it's like a little town yeah i ride that road a lot i sometimes i go up there i don't i don't see a single car and other times i might see a half a dozen yeah but they're always polite I, i'm not getting bombed by razors on that section yeah it's a quiet little community yeah and, and i think it's even sweeter that descent because you know that you're you're kind of the main resupply on the route is is right there within within yeah. uh distance you know yeah and you're not working hard to get to it you're just kind of like mostly just coasting or pedaling easily downhill yeah and it's dirt. so it's much beautiful i mean you can see the views into sedona and you can see the peaks and i don't know it's cool yeah it's pretty awesome. i couldn't because it's all nighttime oh that's so true I don't know. Been, yeah i mean i do it regularly <laughs> enough but you're right probably if someone's starting early in in the day to and just going to go do the route in one go without sleeping they're probably going to be doing that in the in at dusk Depends on the year, time of year, I guess, but it could be dark. Yeah. Yeah. So then you then you hit the main resupply in Camp Verde, which is has got a bunch of 24-hour services, yep. hotels, everything. Um, and uh, do you do you typically stop for food there? Well. Or the one time so, you did yeah, it? Yeah. So, I mean, I stopped there when I was with Joe when we did the sort of like, you know, first iteration of the route. Um, and when I did it with Jacob Miller uh, a couple of years ago. I think it was two years ago now. Uh, definitely stopped there um, at McDonald's. I, I have to stop at a McDonald's. Yeah, yeah that's our. <laughs> it's kind of mandatory. Yeah, it's where we go on dates. Yeah, it's Mac, Mac, Mac D's. Yeah, Mac D's. Uh, <laughs> during, before, and after any long ride is, I, you know, bike riding is really just an excuse to uh, eat McDonald's <laughs> without excuses <laughs> or without without guilt, I should say. And and, and both of our wives shame us for this yeah my so wife's we... not happy about the mcdonald's <laughs> thing if i text her and say oh i'm gonna stop and get some chicken nuggets it's you know it's not a 
<laughs> it's not a friendly text I usually get. Um, a barf emoji or something. Yeah, like we that. get food shame. Yeah. I mean, if I have the option to get McDonald's breakfast, no matter what time of day it is, that's the go-to. Yeah. But there are some McDonald's, unfortunately, that don't do breakfast all day long. It's a heartbreaker for me. And until recently, I was I would I would never order chicken McNuggets, but now I'm like, oh, these go down pretty easily. Yeah, and they don't upset my stomach, so I'm all into chicken nuggets now. McDonald's is kind of that the, you know, the only downside with the McDonald's is it's it it doesn't taste that great like the next day or when no it's no one hundred percent of the times <laughs> I eat McDonald's I eventually regret it. Okay, but while I'm eating it, it's the best thing ever. Yeah, it's it's like I yeah, it's fantastic while you're eating it, like when I'm resupplying on for bike packing but then the problem i have is like what do i get for the next two days from yeah. mcdonald's it's gonna taste if good anyone's listening to this and suddenly was just listening to the last 30 seconds they would think we were nuts <laughs> like why are they talking about mcdonald's why do they enjoy it it's not healthy it's disgusting it's, it's nutrition <laughs> but man when you're out there for a long bike ride it's pretty great <laughs> It's the greatest. <laughs> it's the greatest. P- and pizza breakfast in particular. And McDonald's yeah. are like my go to. Yeah. Pizza particularly packs well. That I I'm a big fan of pizza if I'm gonna stop for a little while. Yeah. It's hard for me to eat pizza and then just get on and keep going. Oh really? But I can just eat McDonald's and go or eat it while I'm riding. But a pizza I it, I have to like it's gonna take a little while a lot longer to settle. So if I'm yeah. gonna like stop for a few hours, pizza's great. But that's hard for me to just pound and go. Yeah. Well, I mean, people can shame us or whatever all they want, but you go try to ride like 250 miles in 24 hours and eat salad or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Calories. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't I mean, exactly work. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying this is a good idea. You shouldn't try and replicate what we're doing. I'm just admitting that I enjoy it. <laughs> this is the one thing. This is, we, we definitely share that. Yeah. So uh, uh, on lots of long training rides during the one attempted VVR that I did and, you know, other times, pinions and pines. When we've gone through there, I'm I'm always going to stop it at that resupply. It's it's key. Yeah, I, I just build it into my plan, and yeah. There's also a Filiberto's there, which I've never stopped at, but I I'd be down for a burrito. Yeah, you know? it's good, but and it's they, so hard for me. Like well, I can't eat McDonald's and Filiberto's. At least right. I haven't tried that yet. I mean, maybe I could. <laughs> um, I'm I'm going to default to McDonald's because it's like I know what they have. I know it's going to be quick. It's very predictable. If I go into Filiberto's, it's like, oh, what am I going to order? How long is it going to take? Mm-hmm. And I and I don't I I want to be able to have the option of turning my brain off if that's what I need in that moment, and so predictability is pretty nice. You need to practice. You need to go do some practice orders at Filiberto's. That's true. That's true. I should like just get to know <laughs> Filiberto's and and plan in advance. They have they're twenty four hours, so I I've stopped there often on Pinions and Pines. Yeah, it's twenty four hours, and they have free chips and salsa at that. Pretty one. nice. So they have like a self serve chip thing. So yeah, yeah it, and they don't care if you take your bike inside. Like they zero percent care. That's good. So it, for me, it's like the all in one stop, and you can get burritos for the next two days or whatever, right? These you, are pro tips for yeah. future VVRs. But you got to spend like yeah fifty bucks in one sitting. Okay. You know? Like I'm sure McDonald's bill isn't cheap. Yeah. <laughs> this this probably will come up now, but for anybody who's listening, I just want to emphasize that you know with my intention with putting this route out there. Um, was not necessarily that everybody had to go ride it as hard and as fast as as they could. Um, I, I think the route's amazing, and actually, riding section of it at night is 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 great if you want to go fast. But there's so many cool things to see. I would encourage lots of people to just go do it as a multi day event. Get together with your buddies. You you could get hotel and lots of different places on route. You could probably even do it without a tent if you were going to take multiple days um, and just stay at hotels. The route's that good. Go as slow or as fast as you want. I encourage people to just go do it. I think I think the route is amazing. Of course, I put it together, so I'm biased, but I think it showcases so many amazing things in Northern Arizona. Yeah, fast, casual, whatever, clockwise, counterclockwise, start wherever you want on the route. I think it's just it's it's really good. Yeah, definitely. We had a plan. I had a plan with Tyler and Tyler's dad, Dan. Uh, we were going to do it clockwise and stay in hotels and do it super casual, like touring. And we were planning on staying in Camp Verde Mm -hmm. and then maybe in Jerome and then maybe in Williams. Yeah. So if you run it that way, there's actually more access to hotels. If you run it counterclockwise, it gets a little tricky on the end. You do like a really big day because if you... You you want to front load the... 
a longer day and actually going in that direction it's a little bit easier because you're descending most of it yeah and there's really no hotels after camp verde going counterclockwise yeah yeah. so so that 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 we we did we were good we were all set up to do it he was going to come out and then it was the year that we had all that rain it was like two years ago yep we had sorry all that snow melt and the the it was last year courses were the course was just yeah late everything had to open late because so much water and yeah. mud and death mud so we called it off so hopefully we get to do it again but this would be i really wanted to like showcase to dan because he's from california kind of i i feel like like you're saying this is like an excellent way to see it on bike by bike to see everything northern arizona has to offer you yeah know? It, it's yeah i mean especially if you're bike packing it or hotel camping like it it's a hard route if you're going to push yourself to go fast as possible but and there's that one chunky section but as far as like a 250 mile route there's not a lot of bullshit on it. It's a pretty good like beginner intermediate route, I think, in my opinion. If somebody does it and <laughs> thinks otherwise, let me know. But I think it's a yeah, you could spend three or four days out there and and really have an awesome time. Sure, for sure. Yeah. And Jerome's a really cool town. <sighs> yeah. Every time I'm in there, I was like, I want to just hang out here for a while. Yeah. So the uh I, I can't remember if this came up earlier, but I, I did a modified version of the route a few years ago with Eddie Bressler. And uh, he got heat stroke climbing up to Jerome really bad. Oh, yeah. Um, and we actually laid down in the park there for a couple hours while he was like recovering. Yikes. And we actually camped up on top of Mingus um, after that. And had to, I think we did it in two days. And I can't remember what section we trimmed off, but um, it was a modified version. So that's another time that I've done most of the route and did it over two days. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So as we continue on our visualization of this, after Camp Verde, Camp Verde is like approximately halfway in. It's maybe 120 or something like that. You might be right. In my mind, it's more than half, but maybe you're right. Yeah, I think it's right about right around halfway in. It's like a, it's like strategically a perfect halfway point, right? Because okay. you got a ton of climbing. You've 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 gotten beat up all day if you do it in one go. It's you're you're in Camp Verde late at night. You kind of, I have to regroup myself at that point and kind of settle in for the long haul at that point if you are doing it quickly in yep. one go, right. Taking on that challenge. So leave camp Verde. Um, and then you start to, you start to take the slow climb, right. And then you're climbing back up kind of onto the Mogollon rim at that point, slowly forever. Yeah. Slowly forever for forever. 10 hours or something, eight hours. I maybe. Don't know. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's not a terribly graded climb. It's, it's, it's not, it's really pedalable and for sure. And even if you're completely wiped out at that point, um, it's still pedalable. Yeah. Um, but you're just like slowly ascending up back onto the rim and heading towards you pass uh, wet beaver. I think it's wet beaver Creek. Yep. Uh, which is a good filterable water spot. Um, and then you continue the, the, the climbing, it kind of parallels the I 17 at that point. And I, I remember being able to see kind of cars off in the distance and be able to see the interstate off on the side. Yeah. Near the top of that climb, you actually get pretty darn close to the, to the interstate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You come very close to it yeah. when it turns back to pavement for a second. Yep. And then it, and then it heads back up on Stoneman Lake road towards Stoneman Lake. Right. I don't know the history of that climb from the, so after you pass wet Beaver Creek, um, you're paralleling I-17. That's that sort of starts at the Sedona exit for I-17 going North. Yeah. Um, that, that section of, of the route is sort of locally called blue dot climb. I, I don't know the origin of that name, uh, or blue, blue grade, not blue dot, blue grade. Okay. Um, and I'm sure you've noticed before there's sections where there's like really old pavement on that road. Yeah. Um, and I, that road certainly predates the interstate and may have been used in the building of the interstate. It certainly parallels it. And there's, I, I've, maybe seen one car on it on the multiple times i've done it there's nobody out there yeah but it's kind of cool you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere but the interstate's kind of just right over there and it's like this old chunky pavement kind of some cool history right i've never stopped because i've always almost been always there in the middle of the night but on that climb there is a, some petroglyphs pictographs i think actually off to the right kind of near where there's a cell tower um, so if anybody's doing the route during the day you should sort of try and figure out on google where those are apparently they're pretty nice i've never stopped but that's right on route and then you get up to the Stone Man Lake climb. Right. Backing up before Stone Man Lake, 
there there is a section there where I, I remember the climbing is pretty chunky, probably the second chunkiest part on the route. Mm-hmm. And you're in that canyon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're in a pretty remote feeling canyon. Yeah, I get the mountain lion heebie jeebies in there every time. Yeah, absolutely. Me Even too. During man. the day. Yeah. yeah. That always. And maybe, maybe now it's I'm self prophesizing, right? It's like, oh, I've got the heebie jeebies here before. I'm going to get them again. Yeah. But when I've been there alone in the dark, I'm always like, mm-hmm. It's like the little cliff there for them to jump off. Yep. It's not too high. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It is chunky, but it's very rideable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then you kind of get up to the top of that and there's a pond off to the right. A little pond. I remember. I think that's near, nearest the, the pictographs. Okay. Yeah. I remember just the frogs were just going nuts at that yeah. point. There were some strange new noises that I heard in that pond one time you yeah, know? yeah you know and then it kind of gets a little the cl- the 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 grade and the road quality gets a little better after that as you then go towards stoneman lake yep because there's people that live up there in stoneman lake it's mm-hmm. like a small community so the road is graded i think occasionally yeah once you hit stoneman lake road it's paved for four or five miles yeah it's kind of chunky <laughs> like there's big cracks in the pavement if you're not paying attention you could stick a wheel in there and <laughs> crash right uh, but you're climbing continuously on that pavement, and then, then you you bang a left at the T, uh, and then it short it, shortly after that it turns to dirt again. But it's really really good dirt. Um, it can be very washboarded, uh, depending on the time of year. Um, the last time I rode it, it was pretty washboardery. Yeah, but it's often gets graded because there are people who live up there, um, and it it kind of actually gets steepish again when you're tired. It's probably not that steep if you're fresh. You just yeah, I've had to walk a couple little bits because yeah, yeah. I'm so done. done the last time I rode it, I was like, it was the beginning of a ride, and I was like, "What? This isn't that steep. Why? Do I, why have I've always been yeah. here and been like dying?" But it's because you're, you know, you're 200 miles into your ride, right? Yeah, and but yeah, you're like, why am I walking my gravel bike with no bike packing gear? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. on this. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of weird things happened to me on that. The first time I did it. I did take a 45 minute nap off on the side of the road on the paved climb after the paved climb, after it turns to dirt. So just below the houses. Yep. Just yeah. below like the kind of the crest of mm-hmm. Stoneman Lake. I was trying to make it to the top and I didn't, and I fell apart and I was like, I'm just going to sleep for an hour. Yeah. And I woke up to like giant logging trucks barreling down the high, the, the, the road, not the highway, the, this gravel road, with, you know, giant lights and noises and loud. And, and it was like three o'clock in the morning and I, I couldn't figure this out. Like you probably thought you were hallucinating. These guys working (laughs) right now. I guess I think they were because there was like two or three of them Hmm. and they were barreling down this road. And I was like way off on the side of the road. Um, but that kind of woke me up and I was like, okay, this is weird. This is a weird thing. And I never, I haven't seen that since on that road, but they were just like logging. And then the second thing, a note on this climb. And I think that this is probably, the reason why I like doing it in the timing that I, that we, that we have both done it in and the direction we've both done it in is as you ascend up to, to Stoneman Lake, it, it feels to me at, at that point, I'm in a different state of consciousness a little bit, right? It feels to me like I'm ascending in a spaceship, like up into like a glass bowl that looks into like the universe, right? Like, like there, there's this place called the Keck Observatory. I've never been there, but I've just heard about it in Hawaii. And mm-hmm. it's supposed to be like, there's no light pollution. You feel like you're in a spaceship in the universe, just an observer in a, in a glass. It bowl, does right? feel a bit like that. And you, cause you come up to it and you feel like you're on the top of the world. And I've seen like shooting stars go across the sky right in front of me. It's a special place up there, dude. It was, it's incredible. Like I look forward to that now. Yeah. Being in that state and being up there. By myself, it's kind of cr- kind of gets crispy and cold at that point, and everything just kind of aligns for this like magical moment for me where I get like really emotional for no reason, you know, just because of how incredible it is right there. Yeah, that place has got a nice kind of energy for me, even even when I'm not 200 miles in and it's not nighttime. Yeah, it's special up there. Yeah, and also you know you're at the top of the climb, so that also adds and the, to, like, the hardest the part. The hardest parts are over at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you still got some miles left, but there's, that's the last big crux. Right. Like, so, so all of that kind of comes together at that moment and it's done it, it both times. It's done it. And the last time I didn't, I didn't sleep. 
uh and it was it was the same exact experience you know it was it was incredible but when you did it it was really cold oh my right? goodness and yeah. you were you went on the stoke podcast and talked about it and and, and in detailed in great detail <laughs> uh but maybe you can recap it really quick i should have looked what the temperatures were i could say some numbers right now and they could they could be wrong in either direction uh, for sure on that route when jacob miller and i started i was it was like oh it's cold it's gonna be really cold and i don't know how i'm gonna react to this but like for most of the day it was really cold and it was okay i right amount of clothing you know i got warmed up on that climb up from the verde up to jerome it was pretty nice it was it was crisp but it was like you know i could take some layers off it was really nice and then the sun went down again and, and at that point you're calorie depleted and you're you know you're dehydrated and then i couldn't get warm after a while so it's like i i climbed up forever from camp verde up 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 you know up blue grade up stone man get to the high point and i start going down at that point there's a there's maybe more down than up and i was wet I, i've never been that cold before um at that point i think jacob was doing better temperature wise than I was. Uh, but we ended up stopping in Mormon Lake village at a bathroom that was open. That was heated. Yeah. It wasn't warm, but it was warmer than being outside. It wasn't that breezy, thankfully, but I don't know. it was 12 degrees, maybe something like that. I'm going to say 18, something like that. Very cold. I was cold. Uh, yeah. And so we were in there I, shivering. I was like, I'm not going to leave here until I stop shivering. And I, we were in that bathroom for maybe an hour shivering. I was Jacob cold? He was. He was not as cold as me. He was colder in the morning than when we started. And yeah. I was like, oh, it's totally fine. But he was cold. I think he could correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but he for sure was not as cold at, at the end as I was. Um, and there were times when I was like like going as slow as I possibly could down every hill. Because if I had too much air rushing over me, my hands were unusable I, I would just start shaking like my bike was shimmy because i was i was like shaking uncontrollably in the oh cold. man um for a few hours um and i was just like you know you're close to home it'd be pretty easy at that point to just be like oh jen come pick me up um and maybe i would have i hope i don't think i would have but maybe i would have if jacob jacob wasn't there so it was kind of nice to have somebody to ride with um and you know, it's like you're so close at this point. Like, you, I'm not going to die out here, but it wasn't fun. Yeah, <laughs> um, I was pretty psyched to to get to the finish. But that, yeah, I mean, that day was amazing. I would say the last few hours, uh, if you just isolate that, was not fun at all. Coldest that I've ever been on a bike, maybe the coldest I've ever been. Period. Yeah. But you know, I'm choosing to go out there and suffer. I nothing bad was going to happen. I could have got rescued if necessary. So I just kept kind of pushing through it. Did. And you to set the, I mean, that's like the fastest time, right? So far? So far, yeah. I think we were uh, 23 hours and some change or something yeah. like that with lots of lingering because yeah. of the cold. Like that that particular time, I don't even know how long we were in the bathroom, well over an hour. Yeah, Just, you, you texted me the other day and you said, I, I, I think we had four hours of stoppage time or stopping yeah. time or something like mm -hmm. that. So when we when we started in the dark, it was not quite as cold at the start. I was okay, but the sun was up and it was like, we were wet and cold when we got to Williams. And so we did, it was a full on yard sale at the McDonald's in, in Williams. We stopped there and just like ripped all of our wet stuff off. And I don't know, we were probably there for 45 minutes. Yeah. Just trying to warm up and dry stuff out and then got on and kept going. Yeah. So and that's. Then, and then Jerome, we, we lingered for a little while and Camp Verde, we did lingered you, for a while. Did you eat in Jerome or did you resupply there? Uh, We did. I don't. We stopped at some little store I'd never been at before. We yeah. weren't there that long, but I would, yeah, we filled up with water, grabbed some food at a store. Like when you pop out on route, you can either go left to go down towards Cottonwood or right to stay on route. And then that's right across the street from the, the uh, fire station. There, there's some little gift shop -y kind of thing there. And we got some drinks and soda there. Okay. It's the yeah. first time I'd ever stopped. I didn't even know it was there. It was just like, here it is. So I was always wondering if there's like a convenience store in Jerome. No. And I don't even know if that thing's still there. You know, things change so frequently in yeah. Jerome because things come and go. Um, if anybody uh, wants to ride the route and you're in Jerome at the right time and you want someplace to stop and like get a good snack or a meal, the Flatiron Cafe coffee shop is fantastic. Uh, the owner is also interested in bikes. And so you can even let them know in advance you're coming and um, 
it, that the food there is great. The conversation's great. It's really small and cute. It's more or less right on route. And then I, with the time I ro- rode the route, most of the route with Eddie Bressler, we stopped for at uh, Haunted Hamburger and, yeah. and had food. Same. Yeah, that's a good spot for a shake and a hamburger. Yeah. yeah it's um, pretty cool. And spot. they did let us bring our bikes back into the patio. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's a that would be a consistently easy thing to do or not. Dep- yeah. It depends on who's working. But And all the hours in Jerome are not very, uh, they're not open late and they... Yeah, not, they they don't open early and they're not open late. Yeah, so you got to time it if you want to yeah. stop in Jerome and you got to be there. You got to be there during sort of like you know waking hours. Yeah, so uh, so this time around, weather's going to be different. It's looking like I hope it's not that cold. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it so far it looks like it's going to be great for weather. Um, what is your? I guess it's been two years. A lot's changed for you from two years ago. Yep. What What would you say is the biggest change in maybe your strategy or your bike or something like that from last time to this time? My my body, is, I mean, I can elaborate on this, but my body's different than it was two years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for sure. Yeah. I can, um, I can come back to that. Uh, part of it, because of my I have problems with both wrists, the first time I did the route, I did it on a gravel bike. Um which I think anybody who's got a healthy body, that's totally a reasonable machine to do it on. Did you um, have a rigid fork or the, I think I had my Lauf on it last time, which I think is, y- y- that's a pretty good combo. And what width of tires do you remember? Yeah, 48s, I think on the wider side. Yeah. On the wider side. I thought, okay. I think I can get anything wider than that on the Lauf. Um, that was a great bike for that. Um, but that's not something I could do with my current state of my wrist. So um, <laughs> I got all the all the <laughs> squishy bits on my bike now to sort of handle my wrist. So I'm on a I'm gonna ride on a mountain bike. I was I recently was treating my mountain bike as my gravel bike. I had a rigid fork on there for a while. That's mostly a okay. But I've done a few chunky things recently where I was like, okay, I'm probably just being a moron about keeping my rigid fork on there. So I put the suspension fork back on. I've got the fast flex handlebars that have the elastomers in them that Kurt Refsnyder likes. I've got those. And then I've got the the newest gigantic uh, uh, Ergon grips, which I'm not sure you've actually seen yet, which are actually fantastic. I cannot remember what model they are, but they're the, the big ones that have like the little thumb catch on there. Okay. I haven't seen I think those. they were even marketed for like e-bikes or something like that for yeah. some reason or touring, but they're, they're great for my wrists. Um, way better than the other Ergon grips. And they're huge. <laughs> they're like... They look like ping pong paddles. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I have those, uh, but I'm then, and I'm running, uh, I think two inch tires, you know, that's not that, 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 that. So my setup's like just trying to treat my wrists, right. Um, rigid hardtail, front suspension, flexi handlebars. I also have aero bars on there. Uh, mostly not just to be aerodynamic, but to just get weight off my wrists. So, so I get in aero bars as, as much as possible, even if probably not <laughs> aerodynamic at all, just to get weight off my wrists. So that's the biggest change is the bike is changing. It's not because it's, uh, I think it's faster. I think, in fact, I think it's going to be a, a way slower bike on the whole route, faster in some sections, but probably overall slower than my gravel bike. It's right. He- it's heavier. So, now, last time when you did it though, on your gravel bike, Jacob Miller did it on a mountain bike. Yeah, he was on a, I think, a full suspension Santa Cruz or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, we we planned on starting together. We made no packs about riding together the whole time. Um, and we were always together. It was like, you know, on, on a section where you'd expect the gravel bike to be faster, it was a lot faster. And yeah. he'd, you know, eventually catch up to me. And if it was a chunky descent, <laughs> he was gone. And I was, he, he's a good descender. I'm a bad descender. And I was on a gravel bike and he was on a mountain bike. So he's like, totally dropped me on that section and then on the you know cherry creek road section and the you know pavement into camp verde i just caught up to him again so yeah. and then eventually we were like you know well we might as well just ride the next 50 miles together because we're been together the whole time right so yeah it'll be really interesting to see how the dynamics will change because we're going to start at the same time and i'm going to be on a gravel bike uh a revel rover yep. with 45 ramblers yep um with aero bars with no suspension no front fork a rigid front fork 
Yeah, I expect you to still go downhill faster than I do in my current state. Probably. <laughs> but the thing is, is like, I'm a terrible climber on no matter what bike I'm on. And you're a way better climber than me. You're not terrible. Well, I'm, I'm, you're way faster than me on that. Like that climb from Jerome up to Mingus. I just, I fall apart on that. Like it's just a road climb and, and you have this, you have like a long history of not only doing road climbs, but like in your sick, weird enjoyment of them. I, I learned this in Iceland. I love it. <laughs> you, how much you loved <laughs> yeah. like road climbs into headwinds. <laughs> I don't like headwinds, <laughs> it but maybe I'm way. better at it than other people. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I like, you know, I like suffering on the bike. Uh, that word maybe isn't the right word for some people, but yeah. um, I like pushing myself and I'm a bigger guy. I, I, I'm not built for climbing, but I, uh, but I enjoy it so much that I think I, I do pretty well because I got the right mind for it. I just, I mean, I, I would rather climb all day long than ever go down a hill. I don't ever, I almost never like going down a hill. I can like name like five descents that I enjoy and that one down to the Verde on uh, Perkinsville Road is one of them. Yeah. And yeah. generally I don't like going down a hill ever. It's just the thing I put up with. So that I can go up. So it'll be interesting because I might be faster than you on the gravel bike down. And you're going to be faster than me on the mountain bike up. <laughs> that should be an equalizer. <laughs> that is the most backwards thing ever, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, so, I mean, is you do you have a goal time? This Are you doing a timing chart and all You know, that? my... <sighs> this is a, a hard thing for me recently with, you know, with my wrists and the other things that I've had going on with like my thyroid over the last few years. Like I've had to recalibrate what my expectations are around on round biking. I mean, every, sometimes I, I go for a long ride and I think, wow, I, I pulled it off. <laughs> like my body's still intact, but sometimes I go out and think, wow, oh, this could be the last time. I don't know. Like my wrists are in such bad shape. I'm just like milking them for all they're worth. And so my mindset about, what I want to get out of biking has evolved a little bit. I'm a little older. Um, since my thyroid issues, I just am not as fast as I used to be. And I was never a superstar in the first place. And so I, and, and I'm older. So I just have to recalibrate my expectations. So there's definitely a part of me that's just who I am. I want to just go ride as fast as I can. Cause I like that. Um, but I mostly just want to go have fun on a bike and be around cool people. That's, that's more important to me. Um, so if I can't go as fast as I think maybe I could, that's totally okay with me. I'm using it as a training ride for ride across Arizona, which I'll do an ITT on a month later. So I'm not going to destroy myself for this event. I'm treating it as a training ride. I'll push myself. I'll do the best I can, but I'm not going to like go so deep that it compromises my, my big goal for the year, which is Raz ride across Arizona. Will you be able to control yourself? If so, like, I think the place that you have to control yourself is early, yeah. right? Where when you're fresh, when you could ride harder, I'm going to tone it down a little bit. Okay. But I also wouldn't be surprised if like, oh, I, this is totally doable. Somebody's going to go under 20 hours. Like I, you know, I think Jacob and I finished in like 23 and a half or whatever. Like it's not going to be hard for you or I, or somebody way faster than us to go. If they're interested in going fast to go sub 20. That could happen yeah. in, in a week and a half. It's not going to be me. Um, it, it could be. I mean, maybe we stick together and we ride the whole thing together. Who knows? Or yeah. or maybe I go way slower than I went last time. Yeah. And that's okay. I just most, I, you know, my goal is like, I want to have an adventure. I want to be able to have another adventure, right? I don't want this to be the last one. So I got to treat my body with the respect <laughs> that it that deserves and just try and figure out how to like get what I want out of the experience, but make sure that I also can get another experience like that in the future. Yeah. He, did, was it, was there kind of a transformational time you had to go through to get to where you are in your headspace now? I mean, it's a day to day thing. I mean, sometimes I think, what am I doing? I'm 49 years old. I'm a big guy. I've never really been that fast. Like, why am I training? Just stop already. Just go ride your bike. And other times I'm like, Oh, I freaking love this training. I love like, figuring out the training plan and sticking to the workouts and like being really militant about it and riding my bike when I don't want to and getting up early. Like, so I, I really, I'm always been like trying to balance, like, what is this really about for me? Right. Versus, you know, 
yeah, I don't know. I mean, so so it's a, it is a ever evolving thing, and it ebbs and flows. Um, and I don't always have my mind screwed on straight about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately, what I consciously know is, I want to ride my bike. I want to have adventures. I want to be with cool people. I want to see cool things. Like that trumps everything. And then just because of who I am, I want to try and go as fast as I can. I want to try and push myself. That's just how I grew up, and I, I enjoy that. Um, I certainly don't fault anyone for just want to go at a casual whatever pace and have it do whatever they're doing, take as long as possible. I think that's totally respectable. I've said this before in other settings, like another big motivation for me going fast is so I can just get the thing over with and get home to my family because it's a big commitment to train and to be gone for these things. And if I just go out and casually do it, I'm going to be gone for two days instead of one day. And that's yeah. a commitment. That's a sacrifice for me and my family. So part of my motivation for going fast is just like, how do I get this adventure in and optimize it so that I'm not sacrificing time with my family? Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things I really like about the VBR is you're, you can do it on a Saturday, be done by a Sunday, you can get some sleep and then you can be back at your life on Monday. Yeah. Right? It's great for us. Cause we're right here. I mean, I'm going to ride from my house to the start. Yeah. P- part of, part of like what, like why I, there were many reasons why I scratched the Arizona trail 800, but one of those reasons was I was overwhelmed by the, by the amount of time when I actually got in there and realized what I, what was actually facing me. And I didn't, I didn't chunk it properly. I should have chunked it better back yeah. then. And, and when I attempted again, I'm going to chunk it better. Like just, just get to Tucson, just get to here, just get to there. But I got like completely overwhelmed by it. And I kind of realized at that point, like at this point in my life, I don't want to spend 12 days on a bike. Right. M- maybe, maybe, later on like i also thought about the tour divide like i do want to do the tour divide at some point but i'm just not ready for that kind of full-on commitment that it takes right now in my life right like i want to get back to work i want to get back to my family you know and and it's it's huge the zone for me right now is like three to four day events max that's like perfect right right and vvr is like a great little like yeah i can just hop in and do it Right. Like didn't plan on doing it. You mentioned it. You, you were going to do it. And I said, uh, yeah, can I, can I join? Like, Absolutely. that'd be great. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you can kind of hop in and do it and not have like a huge training plan for it. Um, if, if you're doing a fast race like that, but I, there is something interesting about this 24 hour. Um, and I haven't done a 24 hour mountain bike race. I, I was signed up for the enchanted, uh, enchanted forest and it fell through that year because of fires. But, um, so VVR was the first 24 hour like effort that I ever yeah. really did. And I realized that I could, okay, break through 24 hours, you know, like, like that was my moment where I realized I could ride for that long. Right. Yeah, I remember having a conversation where, with you when you said like, Oh, I, I, I can't, I'm not sure if you said I can't, but you implied or said explicitly like, Oh I, yeah, I've never done that. I don't, I don't think I could do that. And I didn't, I don't necessarily agree with the sleep deprivation part of it either. <laughs> yeah, and I still like have, tricky. like, I feel like, you only have so many, you can only punch your ticket so many times with sleep deprivation. Yep. And before the train leaves the station. Yeah. I don't think you should do that more than a couple times a year, if ever. <laughs> right. Ideally, you don't ever do that. Right. Unfortunately, we've kind of signed on to these kinds of things where the, for better or worse, the the ethics are, or the ethos is to go as fast as you possibly can, you're going to skimp on sleep either entirely or, you know, minimize how much sleep you get. Well, I think it's way better to get three hours of sleep than no sleep. If you're, if you're like for multi days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, (laughs) the other thing too is, is you can't plan it. I don't know. I've done, I don't have that many experiences with sleep deprivation kind of events. I mean, stagecoach, uh, I didn't plan on not sleeping. I laid down for an hour and a half or hour or whatever. And I slept for like 20 minutes, but you can't plan that. Cause it could just totally backfire. Like it just worked. Oh, uh, you know, I tried to not sleep the first time I did the Arizona 300. <laughs> that was a horrible idea. Yeah. I became so slow. It would have been better if I had actually decided to sleep, but my plan was not to. So then I just tried to keep pushing, not sleeping. That was the plan. It didn't work. Didn't so, you like hallucinate oh, yeah. some, what was it, lady shopping uh, cart? Yeah, shopping, yeah, late, fif, ladies in 50s dresses uh, with shopping carts and little kids running around and like the cactuses were like the the like 
you know, in like JC Penney's where you have the like circles of clothes and the kids were like running in and out of the clothes, you know, but that, <laughs> were the, that was the cactuses. And it, it didn't scare me. I was like, oh, I'm hallucinating. That's kind of weird. I should probably sleep. And so then I tried to lie down and, you know, the minute I got even like 20 minutes of sleep, I was better after that. But it was like, I just kept fighting it because that was the plan. I mean, my point is you, you could plan to not sleep and it might be fine. You could plan to not sleep and that's a horrible idea. So I, to me, it's just like not a good strategy because it's completely unpredictable. You can't train it, nor should you. You can't practice it. You can't. And you don't know what the role of the die is going to be when you try and not sleep. Right. Some people maybe can do that consistently. I can't. I've had great experiences with it and <laughs> absolutely horrible experiences with it. Yeah. From the stuff I've heard, Ma- Matthew Walker, he's a big, he goes on podcasts and he's a sleep researcher and he just did a, he's just doing a six part, uh, special on Huberman actually oh, cool. right now. So, and I got like heavy into it for a while and, um, he, uh, basically it's like low level brain damage, right? When you're not allowing your brain to repair. Right. But he also says there's, there's all kinds of different people. There's people that just in life only sleep three hours or four hours every night. There are those kind of people and they can be fine. Right. And then there are the people that require nine hours of sleep or 10 hours of sleep. Like Jessica, she needs a lot more sleep. Yep. She just, my wife too. She just needs it. Right. And um, I'm like a seven hour to eight hour guy. That's about where I'm at. So I think like those people can be, that variety of person can be in bikepacking or do yep. these events. And like maybe like Strimke's one of those people who can just like not sleep a whole lot, for example, because he seemed, he seemed to do it a lot there in one year he did a lot of sleep deprivation when he was doing yeah. the tour divide. Right. But maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't affect him as much, you know, as, as it would, it would affect me or something like that. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's, and there's a lot of debate on performance too, on, on like what it actually does for your performance recovery. Even if you sleep to three to four hours, like that, that it, that you can actually go much faster and feel much better and make up that time. Uh, yeah. It probably depends on the duration. You know, um, it's probably certainly the case that somebody could go fast enough on VVR and sleep for four hours and definitely still be under 24 hours. Like, I think there's plenty of people out there who probably can do that or substantially faster than, right. than us. Um, if that's the kind of thing that someone wants to do. And I would encourage people to do that instead of not sleeping at all. Right. I'm going to choose to just push through because that's kind of how I want to do it. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily good for your body in the end. And I say it's training for ride across Arizona, but the reality is I'm going to also, it's not perfect training. I'm going to test my systems. I'm going to test being on the bike that long, but like, I'm not going to build fitness as a result of this. I'm probably actually going to tank my fitness (laughs) probably. So, um, it's probably not ideal training, but I'm going to do it anyway. Cause I, cause I want to, I want to have that experience. I want to go out there and ride it with you. And I want to see that stuff. Cause I, you know, I didn't get to really do anything like that last year. So, yeah. Yeah. And this will be your first kind of big thing since stagecoach, right? Yeah. So after stagecoach that following summer, uh, you and I went to Iceland and rode. that certainly wasn't a, a, a like in a, a race. We were, you know, just riding around, having a good time, right. Riding big miles. It was hard, but we weren't racing. And, and then I fell on the last day in Iceland and screwed up this wrist. And for whatever reason, my other wrist decided it was going to just, sympathize and also hurt yeah um and so that yeah i haven't done an, an like a an, a racing kind of event go as fast as you can since stagecoach uh, over a year ago and you're using the you have the 1040 solar i do for nav yeah and you like it love it do you do the turn by turn do you have that turn like the so i kind of have most of the features in the thing turned off yeah i don't like it beeping at me it's overwhelming at first. Yeah. So like I, the only beep I currently have on there is uh, I have the Varia radar on the back. Right. So the only time my GPS beeps is if a car is coming from behind me. Right. That's it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, all the other, all the other audio is turned off and then I don't like it telling me where the turns are. I just like to look at the, the track. Right. And on VVR, I could go do the thing without, <laughs> without the GPS even on. Sure. Yeah. I found the turn by turn. Coming from an e tracks the turn-by-turn was amazing. 
Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to it. I just, you know, I, I kind of just started by just turning stuff off I, I, what seemed to be annoying, and I probably overdid it. Yeah. Mostly because I just didn't like all the chirping. Right. Um, and so I probably turned off some nice features. <laughs> right. Yeah. Although yeah. when you and I last rode, there was some feature that somehow got turned on for mine that I hadn't turned on after an update, and now I had that climb thing. Oh, yeah. The, which I kind of like. The and, category of the climb. Yeah. That how much how much duration is left and that sort of thing. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. The yeah. Climb, it's it's not necessarily climb pro, but it was something like that. Maybe it is the same thing, but I had, th- I had that turned off and now it's on and I just haven't bothered to turn it off again. And it, I don't hate it. I can swipe it out if I don't want to look at it. Do you have different profiles? Do you use that feature where you have like a mountain biking profile? and a Yeah, profile? they almost look identical. I have a couple subtle differences. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, thanks for the tip on the broadcast mode on the watch. Cause I, I have like an old forerunner 35, like super old, yeah. but it has the broadcast mode on it Yeah. and it, and it would broad, it broadcast my heart rate to the, the 1040. Yep. So now I can, I've, I've configured my average heart rate and then my um, current heart rate on a different screen so that I can kind of, cause I, I did find that helpful in stagecoach was watching my heart rate and it gave me an opportunity to slow myself down, especially like at the beginning, like you were saying earlier, when you like yeah, go out of the gates hot, you know, and you're all jacked up on adrenaline. Everyone's biggest mistake. Yep. And you go out (laughs) and I'm like kind of a slow starter. So it's really cool to be able to, you know, say, okay, I'm going to stay at like 150 or below heart rate. That's a good heart rate for For, me. For you. So, so what, what's your life? I mean, I, I can go forever heart rate. Oh, that's a good question. Well, first of all, forever, there's no such thing. Like you're, you're, you're not going to be able to get your heart rate very high on day two or three of an event. Right. So like trying to keep it below a certain range for an entire multi-day event is probably, for, at least for me, not meaningful. Because like I have no idea what my heart's going to be doing on day two or three. It's kind of only <laughs> predictable on day one. Okay. And then I would use my heart rate. I, I have power also that kind of will just keep me from going too hard. Right. right? I got to have a plan. And try and stick to it. Like, don't go too hard. Don't like go too deep, right? Because you're you you might go fast in that moment, but you're gonna pay for it later and end up going slower. Right. But I think you know, like on day two or three, like I can't get my power up even if I tried. I can't get my heart rate up even if I tried. And so then maybe I'm still going at like the same thing, but my perceived effort is way higher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you really do you spend a lot of time paying attention to the power meter? I is do nowadays. It's a thing I love and hate. Um, I think it's a very useful tool for me. I'm following a training plan, and so it's all power based. Mm. Um, so I do pay attention to it during workouts and that sort of thing. And then you know, on longer rides where I'm you know not riding really hard, it kind of keeps me you know in the in the right zone. Um, but I also hate it because I'm like, oh, it's like kind of taking the fun out of biking sometimes. I just want to go ride my bike and I want to look around and sometimes I want to ride hard and sometimes I want to not know if I'm riding slow or fast or hard and being judging myself. I just want to ride my bike. And so I love it and hate it. Yeah. I do think it's a good tool if you're performance oriented and you want to, you know, peak at certain moments and follow a training plan, you know, it's, it's great, but it kind of does also take the fun out of things sometimes. Is it kind of pointless on a mountain bike? No, I don't think so. Okay, because I have one on my mountain bike, and I'm kind of like, and I don't have one on my gravel bike, but it seems like it's, I don't know, would lend itself a lot more to the gravel bike. You can put out certainly more consistent power on a gravel bike. It's probably better to train by power on the road or gravel. Yeah. Than it is to train by power on the mountain bike, especially on like punchy terrain. Like you could say, oh, I'm going to ride a, yeah. I'm going to ride zone two or whatever power thing. But then if you go ride around here, you're like... You, you can't actually ride the stuff and stay in zone two. You got to punch it to right. like get over rocks and things. So Right. You would just have to look at your average probably, but it doesn't really do much for you in the moment. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. Normalized power as opposed to the average, but yeah. So you got the navigation, you have the, what other tech do you have? So you have the radar <laughs> in the back. Which I wouldn't use on a mountain bike, obviously, but I, but I have on my mountain bike for these gravel type things. Uh, Right. I'm a dad. I've had way too many close calls recently with cars. One just the other day where I think I came centimeter from death. Um, so near, scary. Near your house. So, you know, so I'm like. It's so scary. I'm I gonna, do not trust people. Like, no. And I, I trust them less every day when it comes to driving. Yeah. And I don't know if this person even saw me. Maybe they did. Maybe they were like, oh, I'm 
I'm far enough away from. I I don't really know, but uh, I I I don't want to die. I don't want to get hurt. I'm a dad. I'm a I'm a husband. Uh, I care about my well being. I I sometimes wear the bright yellow vest and I I use the radar as much as possible. I, the, unfortunately, especially mine, like Joe Pavlik lasts like twice as long as mine. The battery life on that thing is garbage, and mine in particular. I've tried setting it up to make it last as long as possible. Like it, I can't run that whole thing for VVR and it, it, it's not going to last. Yeah. So I'll be strategic in turning it on and off. Yeah. Uh, I but, mean, the only really super sketchy part for cars on VVR is for me is the climb up from Jerome that like no shoulder pavement swervy climb that goes from Jerome to the Mingus. Yeah. Um, that's the part that I'm always like, super nervous about i'm usually going up it in dusk also yeah so i think having a blinky light on that climb is nice because of the dusk thing for sure is there any other questionable spots i actually think because that road is so twisty turny my perception is certainly you can get hit by a car anywhere yeah Uh, i actually feel like that's less dangerous than long straightaways where people aren't they don't quite have to pay as attention as much they're zoning they could be kind of zoning out yeah Maybe messing with their phone or whatever. And I feel like those kind of sections are, are way more dangerous. That's my argument for side by sides when I when I steel man your case about your your side by side hate is <laughs> is a, at least a different their, podcast, right? At, yeah, we'll cover that. We'll cover that later. We'll dedicate a podcast just to the side by side hate. <laughs> but Lo- locusts. But yeah. it's related. The, the, when they're driving the side by sides they're usually like engaged in driving and at least they're not on their cell phone. Right. So kind of what you're saying about they're having to engage in these turns and stuff. Right. That's true. So, but anyway, back to almost getting hit. So you were out like on the 180. I was on 180, uh, just past the turn to your house. Yeah. And you know, that section where it's like for 200 meters, there's like no shoulder on the curve. Yes. I'm always nervous there. Yeah. Uh, cause there's not much shoulder when there is everywhere else. And I feel like, you know, they're just leaving a residential zone. They're starting to speed up. It, it just feels sketchy right there. I just wish there was like six more inches of pavement. Yeah. Um, and especially with my mountain bike bars that are pretty wide, I could be pretty far to the right of the white line and my handlebar or my elbows kind of stick into the lane. I'm, I'm over as far as I can go. And so I'm always a little nervous there. I kind of have a tactic when I think I, hear cars that i'm kind of feeling like are in a sketchy spot i usually will stand up in pedals just so i'm moving more and a little bit more visible yeah um for whatever reason radar chirped i could hear it was a big truck (laughs) noise i could tell it was coming fast i decided i would duck and i'm pretty sure if i had not ducked the mirror on the truck would have taken my head off at 50 miles an hour whoa and it grazed my elbow the back of the truck like what like yeah. you felt the yeah i mean if it touched it or just got really close to yeah. it or whatever and then of course the wind kind of like oh my god you know pushed dude. me off and yeah i mean a, a centimeter or two in the wrong direction and i'd be into the barbed wire on the side of the road there yeah it's so scary so how would the radar help you well i knew the car was coming before i heard it because it chirped yeah so, so i did i did to- it did well if there's a wider shoulder i would try and i'm always going to try and get on the way i would right. consciously make decisions about standing i at least can tell how many are behind me it does give me some awareness i'm not i don't just look at it and be like oh they're going to see me i know they're there it does kind of cause me to make some subtle decisions to kind of get out of the way maybe stand up and get bigger in this particular case i decided to duck which i probably would not have if the radar hadn't chirped at me yeah i mean dude that's so wild who knows you know so I've had close calls like that. Too many. I'm really grateful that I'm not, you know, broken. But I don't like that. I, I want to be able to ride safely. I feel like I make pretty good decisions about riding on the road. Um, yeah. So the radar is a, a key technology feature for me to doing, you know, roads that are involving lots of cars or razors or that sort of thing. At least a blinky light, if not the radar. Yeah. Do you ever listen to music? I do. I do listen to music. That's kind of a recent thing. I used to. Or podcast. Yeah. I used to kind of poo-poo people about putting headphones in and then I started doing it. So I kind of changed my mind a little bit. I do have the conduction earphones so that I actually have full hearing. Yeah. I mean, it's distracting, right? I mean, if you you have audio playing, even if they're not in your ears, it's still compromising your hearing. But um, so I try not to ever have it any louder than necessary. They're the conduction type, so my ears aren't blocked because I want to be able to. I mean, a I want to be able to hear the sounds of nature, um, 
but I want to be able to hear cars and that sort of thing coming or a mountain lion jumping off a rock above me. Or <laughs> yeah, whatever. like you're ever going to hear a mountain lion. <laughs> but it's going to go rawr and jump off the rock. Here I come. <laughs> yeah. Give you a warning yeah, rawr. Yeah. That's because that's exactly what, yeah. what predatory I'm gonna hear, cats I'm going to hear do. the claws just <laughs> take off just before it latches on the back of my neck. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they make all that, like the the AirPods or have like the transparency mode now, which is like the it sounds yeah. like the same sort of thing where you can hear out also. Yeah, because I, I used to also get mad at people. I'm like trying to get up a trail and somebody has noise canceling earbuds in and you can't even like they don't, can't even hear my bell, yeah. you know, and I'm like in Sedona. I've had a few of those situations. I had one on the MT on the Maricopa Trail r- ride where I was behind this guy for like, I don't know too long and i find i was like yelling at him and he couldn't mm-hmm. hear me yeah that's annoying I, so mine nobody could come up behind me and not have me not hear them yeah so i mean i might be in la la land and not hear them but that's not because i don't have ears it's because i'm just totally spaced out zoning out <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah um yeah i mean so i'll do mixed i'll, I'll sometimes i'll uh I'll ride the first. I, I actually used to go heavy into podcasts when i first got into bikepacking and like distance stuff and now i i kind of use it as a boost mm-hmm. deep in totally yeah where i'll just do no headphones and no nothing for the first like 10 or 12 hours yep or until i start to really fade and then i'll pop them in just for kind of a change of pace and like something to distract me from you know how i'm feeling at that time yeah when i when i start getting to a point where i'm like counting down the minutes seconds and tenths of a mile it's a good time for me to kind of like do something that kind of takes my mind off trying to watch time click by slowly. Yeah. Um, so I kind of use it as a reward. I do think it is uh, a nice thing. I, I wouldn't want to do like uh, any long ride or event or whatever where that's all I did was like tune out nature. I want to spend some time being able to kind of hear what's going on around me and kind of like get into that mode. Mm-hmm. Um, I've kind of gotten into it maybe a little bit too much. My excuse <clears throat> there is that like I started to listen to podcasts and now I have like this list of podcasts. It feels like a to-do list. And if I don't spend time listening to them, the list just grows and then I get stressed. So uh, <laughs> podcast anxiety. Yeah. yeah. So then I'm like, well, if I'm going to tick these things off so I can get to the next one and learn more, I got to like do it while I'm writing. So yeah, it, it, it's a silly anxiety thing, but no, it's I like, understand. Yeah. It's like, Oh, this is a perfect time for me to catch up on this. And like when I walk to work or walk home, that's another good time for me to, to do it. Cause it's really the only time I listen to podcasts, like walking to work, walking home. Right. Occasionally on long bike rides. Maybe when I'm riding the trainer in the garage. Usually I just put music on for that. Really? Yeah. For the trainer? You spend a lot of time on the trainer too. I'm kind of getting sick of it. Yeah. It's the well, first time in a long time where like I'm just two like. hours a day. I'm like, I'm kind of done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm over it now. Yeah. What's the longest trainer ride you've ever done? Uh, I did four hours once oh last, my God. last year, I think. But I've done quite a few, you know, two and a half, three hour rides. And, and, and early in the season, that's totally fine. I don't mind. I can do it. But right now, like two hours is starting to feel like an eternity because I've just been doing it so much. I'm like, I want to go outside. Yeah. And, you know, it's, 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 it's harder. Yeah. So I don't enjoy it as much. And that, I think that's one thing about like training. It's like, I feel like I have to do it. I kind of like that I'm making myself do a thing I don't necessarily want to. It requires a sacrifice and like some diligence. I like that. But on the other hand, I'm like, why am I? Like, who cares if I'm fast or slow? Like, why am I riding the bike in the garage right now? It's so stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you're just having this internal battle with yourself, yeah. right? Like, I, I get it, man. Like, yeah. some some days I'm like, oh, I just want to be lazy today. I have this, like, vision of myself just, like, chilling out at the house all day, you know, on Sunday doing nothing. And then I get an hour and a half in and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? I start to... I don't have a to-do list, so I start to like spiral into a death spiral, you know? And I I'll almost never have the opportunity to just lay around all day. Like there's work to do or family stuff to do or yeah. a bike ride to do. So part of my motivation for getting a little burned out on it's like, well, okay, I'm not having that much fun right now. And I have this <laughs> giant list of shit I got to do. Right. So I'm like anxious to just get it over with. So, right. Yeah. So but the one thing for sure is exercise every day, like resets one person, i mean i'm always you know? grateful that i did it when i'm done yeah and most of the year i'm totally fine doing whatever i have to do on the trainer in the garage because we got snow on the road here i'm always going to ride outside if the opportunity presents itself yeah um but right now for the first time in my life i'm like eh, i'm done with the trainer 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you get, um, do you kind of like spiral when you can't exercise? Cause you, your, your body's so accustomed to doing it every day or, um, not time? necessarily right away. Like right now I've been riding a lot. I feel like I'm like, oh, I could use a little break. Right. Um, so if I suddenly like, I, I just had two days off and I was totally fine with that. Oh, okay. Well, you yeah. earned it in your I was head, like, right? Okay. So that, so I didn't get twitchy at all, but if like right now, if like I had to take like a week off cause I got hurt or something like that, I'd start to kind of get a little grumpy probably. Yeah. 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 Well, you do a lot of other things too. You go to the Grand Canyon all the time. You're always hiking in the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Um, in, in addition to the trainer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you go from like the boringest thing to the most epic, amazing, majestic place yeah. ever. <laughs> the canyon's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You spend a lot of time there. I dig it. I don't spend that much time there and I don't know why I should. I just don't know. It's a know? kind of new thing for my wife and I. Like mm. she started going pretty regularly a few years ago and then she was probably going pretty regularly for a year or two before me. And then, and then I went and I, I was like, what? this is amazing. Like, why did I just never have a desire to do this? Like, I just, I wasn't into it. Like, you know, early in my early years of like endurance type sports, like I was all about rock climbing. Like that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. And I loved long hikes to get into Alpine routes and that sort of thing. And that stuff exists in the Canyon, but I hadn't really done any of it, but I was just like, Oh, the can it's too big. I can't even appreciate how big this thing is. It's like too overwhelming. And I just wasn't into like hiking for hiking sake. I was mm -hmm. like, I'll hike if I got, can go climb and that's all I cared about. Yeah. But now I'm like, oh, hiking's pretty cool. And the canyon's amazing. I mean, I, it's for sure one of my favorite places on the planet. Yeah. Yeah, I have my bucket list is to do a rim to rim to rim run with Jess at some yeah. point. Oh, yeah. yeah. I haven't done it, but yeah, bucket list. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever run out of things I want to do in the canyon. I feel like I've done quite a bit. There's plenty of people who've done way more than me, but... I could kind of just slowly tick these things off. And as I learn more about the Canyon, I'll learn about another thing I haven't done. Yeah. It's a little longer, or a little variation or that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's a, huge. It's huge. Like you could spend a lifetime in there. Yeah. It's, um, it's an incredible place for sure. So, uh, all right, let's, uh, let me, let's jump into some of these. We've already answered a bunch of these questions. But let me just go through them again and make sure we got everything. Yep. So these are from Robert Anderson. Okay. Um, so thanks, Robert, for emailing in um, your questions about the VVR. Uh, so let's see, tire selection. I My response for tire selection was, I think the narrowest I would go is maybe 40 or 45s. Just because of that chunky section it always haunts me. Yeah. What's your opinion on? I'm a horrible about this stuff. Everybody thinks I should know all the details about suspension setup and tire pressure and tire width. And well, what would I'm you a, run? I, I don't know. I run what I have. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I'm horrible at this. I, I ask I ask Jesse what I should do half the time. But What's, but when you but, do run a tire, do you are you know, are you like, oh that was too do you feel like it was too wide of a tire? Or? I've never in my life once said that tire was too wide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never had that thought. Interesting. Um, never occurred to me. I do want, you know, if I'm going to try and go fast, I want to try and optimize. So I spend a little bit of time thinking about it, look to see what other people did and assume that they were anal enough to figure out what the right tire was and then maybe I'll copy. Um, given, you know, my gravel bike that I rode VVR on, I'm pretty sure the widest tire I could have got on there with my Lauf fork was a was a 48. I would have, I would run wider if I, I could have. I think that was the widest I could get on my fork at the time. I have two inch tires on my mountain bike right now, which I think is going to be perfect for, for that distance and that terrain. You could easily do it on a narrower tire. I mean, people love that kind of underbiking stuff and that that's totally fine. Yeah. There's just a few chunky sections where you'd be like, I wish I had a wider tire, but for 240 miles, you're going to be psyched with the, the bike you have. So, right. Yeah. 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 It's a very, it's such a variable course though that yeah there's not like that's what i'm finding with a lot of these things there's there's a perfect bike for this section and then a perfect bike for that yeah. section so yeah finding so the middle there's is no hard. there's no perfect bike for the whole thing right you're compromising someplace uh i've always just aired it aired on the side of like durability and comfort for long events yeah as opposed to like speed which is gonna i'm gonna like potentially suffer at 15 hours in because yeah. I'm just getting bounced all over the place. And with my current body, I don't want to be bouncing all over the place and suffering. 
Yeah, and that was a huge thing for me was adding the arrow bars for the comfort factor. Yeah. It made a huge difference last year, the second time I did it compared to the first time I did it, mm -hmm. yeah. both on gravel bikes. Yeah, so I've spent so much time on the arrow bars this year because of my wrists now that this is very comfortable for They're me. They're amazing. Yeah. I mean, they don't just add like arrow position for me. They add kind of this half arrow where yeah. like my forearms are on the pads and then uh, my hands are kind of down a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives a little relief and then you can go up on top. Oh of yeah, like, like 20 hours in. Yeah. That, up, that upright position feels great, oh, doesn't it? amazing. <laughs> the upright, it's amazing. Yeah, like it's the least aerodynamic thing in the world, but now you're like way taller than you normally would be. You can get some weight off your hamstrings and weight off your back. Yeah. Yep. So you've you've added at least three different positions just with the mm -hmm. arrow bars. So, yep. I mean, that is, is worth way more uh, than the weight that it's adding, right? Just oh, that for, comfort factor. For sure. I'm going to be more likely to finish, more likely to like, have my body feel good and, and you know you're even if you have like an upright arrow position you're definitely going to be going faster on the, over a long course like that if you're in the arrow positions but for me it's all about saving my wrists and comfortable and then the added bonuses that's probably faster yeah when it can be yeah definitely uh any hike bike sections we kind of talked about this yeah i don't I, you know i think uh certainly if someone's doing it over multiple days and Probably, I would guess most people, most of the time, won't get off their bike. There, that section that you had forgotten about from the summit of Mingus, up and down, up and down before you do the chunky descent. There are a few steep pitches in there, which you know, if I'm feeling pretty knackered, I could probably get off and walk for 50 feet or so. The end of the really long climb, after you know, climbing up to Stone Man Lake, if you're feeling pretty knackered, it's pretty steep at the at the top. You might get off. Is it a hike a bike? No, it's probably like, oh, I'm just tired in the road steep enough. <laughs> I don't have the energy right now. Yeah. But no, no sustained hike a bike. And I would say most people, um, if they're feeling good when they're doing the route, you're, you're not going to have to get off and walk. Do you, do you agree? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, we covered washboard roads, uh, suspension forks, uh, or a suspension stem. You know, that's kind of, yeah, again, I think that's variable. You know, that's variable for people. Um, I, I need that kind of stuff right now for, for my body. Yeah. Um, but some people don't. And if they're comfortable with that, skip it. <laughs> yeah. And I don't have it. But I did think about running it on the Epic Evo, the cross country mountain bike, because that bike can, it's super comfortable and it can climb. Yeah. It would okay. be interesting for you to, you know, feeling the same, going to VVR sort of comparable fitness wise and do it on both bikes. Right. I, I wonder which bike would be faster. Yeah. Yeah. First 12 hours, probably your gravel bike. Over the course of 24, your Epic might be faster. I think I'm definitely a stronger climber on the cross-country bike than on the gravel bike. You spend so much time on your mountain bike. Yeah. Yep. Right. Like long, long climbs just all day. I, I know that. I know that position, you yeah. know? Yep. So maybe that's it. Uh, so are some of the distances between water refill are long in distance? Are they long in duration as well? Um, is five liters oh, enough? It, of course, it, the answer depends on how long you plan on being out there. If someone's trying to crank it out in as quick as possible, you don't need five liters. If someone's doing it over multiple days, you probably still don't need five liters. Um, the driest section is probably also the easiest. Like if you're going counterclockwise, you know, the loop going north to, to Williams and Parks, that might be the longest miles wise where you don't have access to water. And it's not that hard, relatively speaking. At the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. And then you're fresh if you're going counterclockwise. Right. Um, it's cooler. It's cooler. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got, I mean, all the water sources that I'm aware of that are on route or on the ride with GPS, which you can get to from the, from the website. Um, and I've tried to indicate which ones are potentially suspect if it's seasonal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's enough water on route that, that I mean, I, I'm certainly not trying to sandbag anybody. Uh, carrying five liters would be fine. That's probably overkill for almost everybody. Yeah. The only, the only thing I'd say is in the hot sections, the Camp Verde section, if you're there in the, in the, in the full on heat, if you do it at a certain time of year, or the section from Perkinsville Road up to Jerome, you can go through water. You can certainly go through water. That could take many hours. But right. if someone's aware of their how hot it is, how they respond to heat, right? 
what the temperature is, you got water access at the Verde. You'd be foolish not to take on as much as you think you need. If you're getting near the top and you realize you're carrying all extra water, you could potentially dump it and then refill in Jerome. Right. But you got to make sure you're hitting Jerome during open hours to get water. So there is a fire station that I think has a hose bib out back. And last time I was there, the hose bib didn't work. But then there was a bathroom. In the alley. Mm-hmm. Which in I actually alley. went into for the first time this past week. Is that 24 hours? I have no idea if that's open 24 yeah. hours. It's it's a nice bathroom. The bottles go underneath there. Right. It's pretty really easy. That's nice. It's right on route. Like you could just go through the alley on your bike um, and get right and into that bench. bathroom. There's a bench right yeah, there in a, in, a, in a garbage can. It's, it's a, great. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but I don't know if it's 24 hours. Okay. I, and, and I wouldn't even know if it's consistently 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, but if you're hitting Jerome, not during open hours, you may not actually, you could be in a town and not find a spot to get water. So that's something that people would have to consider. So that's right. that that's important to recognize. Right. And then it's a long ways. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You got a big section there. Okay. So yeah, let's be fair. I guess the, where I would make sure that I had enough water it's climbing from the Verde up to Jerome if it's hot. Yes. But you got access to water at the river. You can top off as you need it. It's time Jerome. You got to get water there during open hours. If it's it, it can be a very, in my opinion, a very long way from Jerome up Mingus, all the rollers, down Cherry, down Cherry Road into Camp Verde. That to me, that's probably the longest stretch where it's kind of remote. Yeah. And there's no access to water other than Jerome. There may or may not be a water spigot at the campground on the summit of, of Mingus. I've actually never stopped to check. Um, so there could be a spigot up there. Obviously, that would be 24 hours if it exists. Um, they might winterize that, though. Yeah. So you got to time it just right. Yeah. Um, so that's a long stretch. I think that's, you know, and it's definitely hard. And you're out there in the middle of nowhere. So I would say, you know, that's the section I personally would probably want to be the most prepared with water. Yeah. Jerome to Camp Verde going counterclockwise. Especially if it's hot. I didn't even consider that at that section. Yeah, if you're if you're not. doing, you know, multiple days, you're yeah. going to be doing that in the middle of the day. You're a little higher, so it's probably not too bad, but you know, it's exposed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's totally worth it, but you you might have to carry extra water. And on this note, what about food? Uh how much did we carry and were the town stops enough? Town stops in my mind are plenty. Um, even if you're doing it over multiple days, because you you go through parks, you got options there. If you're there during open hours, you got Williams. 20, is, there's a 24 hour Circle K in Williams. Yep, 24 hour Circle K. You got McDonald's, other options, right. grocery store, tons of things in Williams. Um, and then Jerome is limited, but plenty there if you're there during hours for food. Camp Verde, everything you could possibly want. Right. Um, and then it's kind of a long stretch from there. To Flagstaff, but if you time the hours right, you could stop at Mormon Lake Lodge or right. the store. And then there's also the Lake Mary Country Store, just you know, maybe ten miles before the before the finish. But again, those are limited hours, something you have to plan on. So right. you gotta plan your hours from Camp Verde to the finish if you're going counterclockwise. Uh, but if you're doing it over multiple days, there's plenty of options. Yeah, and I forgot to mention Mormon Lake Lodge, because there's a potential if you're hotel camping, you could stay at the lodge there. Right. Totally. And they have a night, really nice restaurant and a nice country store. And yep. they're super friendly to um, like Arizona trail through hikers and stuff mm-hmm. and bikers and stuff. Yep. They're really cool at the country store. Absolutely. But yeah. uh, limited hours, you know, it's not open at 9 PM. Did I say Mormon Lake Lodge or did I say Lake Mary country store? You may have said both. Okay. I but... meant Mormon Lake. Yep. Yeah. Mormon Lake's got like all the, the lodge yep. and the, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the Lake Mary Country store also limited hours, but very close to the finish. You know, if you if you made it there and you were suddenly out of food or water, you could, you know, you could limp into the yeah, finish. You're close. Yeah. yeah. And I don't I don't remember what I carried. I might I'm gonna plan this my strategy this year is gonna be to carry more calories. Basically just pick up more food. I, I've decided not to just carry everything for the whole race, but I've decided to make a very quick resupply stop in, in uh, Camp Verde cool. and hit a gas station and resupply on calories there instead of stopping and sitting down and having like a meal. I usually have done that and spending like an hour yep. the last two times. So I'm going to try and shave off some time that way. Um, but so carry everything. Uh, I, I have to do the math on the calories, 250 calories per hour, 12 or 14 hours to Camp Verde and then repeat after that. Yeah. So my target caloric intake is 90 grams 
of carbohydrates per hour, which We're is in- three, 360 calories of carbohydrates. Anything else after, on top of that is bonus. I've done a few experiments. I can totally handle it. Are you going to do the gels? I'm going to do whatever I can get my hands on. Okay. Uh, but I'm certainly going to start with the Morton gels um, and their hydration, uh, not hydration, their uh, drink mix. Yeah. Um, but I have to, it doesn't quite work out to 360 calories. Um, so I got to add, add a little bit of stuff there and then they, they don't really have any salt in there. So I got to, I got to get salt and magnesium in other ways. And so mm-hmm. I'll probably use some element stuff in my water also. Um, that, that is, uh, I've been increasing the amount of calories that I do during these events, uh, over the last couple of years, this is a newish sort of thing. And I was like, Oh, that sounds like a lot. I was always shooting for 200, 250. And now it's like, it's 300, 350. So now I'm doing. And it's paying dividends, you think? You see? It's hard to tell. I haven't done a 24-hour effort, but um, the longer rides I've done. Um, I mean, a lot of people just can't eat that much. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if I could. So if I, And you got to test it. Right. And so so far, so good. Eat that much for 24 hours. Yeah. That's a whole different thing than an yeah, so eight-hour training so, so ride. I, so I haven't done 24 hours. Right. 10 hours, eight hours multiple times like what are those gels going to be like after they're they're <laughs> they're not hours. flavored at all i actually have not gotten sick of them yet i actually really enjoy them now the downside of those things in particular they're just too expensive yeah. so I, I wait till i get like a discount 28 percent off on on the feed and then kind of buy them in, in bulk because they're, they're not cheap it's kind of stupid i mean yeah. almost embarrassed to say that i use them but they don't sell like a giant pouch that you can like shoot into the little pouches <laughs> i mean you probably could yeah so anyway that's been working for me um there's probably other things out there that would could work too that are less expensive but it also costs money to experiment yeah so yeah this all this costs money but i'm gonna stop in williams we can make McDonald's because i have to in williams oh, yeah, yes yeah no matter if we're together or not i'm stopping i'm getting breakfast sandwich okay I'm not going to stop. I know you're not. We just established that right now. (laughs) I am no matter what. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then I'm also going to stop in, in, in Camp Verde. Yeah. And that's it. All right. Interesting. And then I'm going to fall apart uh, on the Mormon, uh, on the Stoneman Lake climb. And you're going to catch me at that point. (laughs) Potentially. (laughs) Because that's a really long climb. And we already talked about how that's going to work out. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Nighttime riding, any sketchy sections or high traffic sections. We covered this a little bit. For me, it was the bit from, uh, Jerome up to Mingus. That, that was the only part where I felt a little, you know, like I needed my blinky light on. Yeah. I I'm, yeah. I'm less worried about that section for me at night. Uh, the section that I am worried about, there's very little traffic at night, but here's a situation where the road is not twisty turny and it is paved. So when you, the stone man Lake climb that the paved part, it's, it's basically dead straight for cars and they tend to go way too fast out there. Cause there's no police. There's, yep. Um, there's very few people. They go way too fast. They're not expecting us to be out there. I would never ride that section at night without a blinky light. Yeah. Because you might see one car, but it could be going 80 miles an hour and they might not be paying attention. It's a straight shot. They don't have to pay attention. Yeah. So that that's the, to me the sketchiest spot. In fact, one year for Pinions and Pines, I literally made us go in the most ridiculous way possible just so I wouldn't put 74 people on that road. Right. But for VVR, one or two people, myself included, uh, I, I think it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So to um, me, that's the sketchiest spot at night. Yeah. That's a good point. Lake Mary road a little bit too, but there's a big shoulder on that. So yeah, I read that so often that I mean, you could get hurt that people have, but yeah. that's not like a, a predictably dangerous spot. The only thing that was really dangerous for me on the last one was there was a giant, I don't know, six inch, uh, log or piece of a tree in the bike lane. And it snuck up on me because I'm cruising on that. Yeah, yeah. And my light only, you know, go, goes true. out so far. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's this, I mean, it would have been like an over the bars Ooh. ender for yeah, me. Yeah. Right. And I like had the, uh, the, the mind, uh, wherewithal, wherewithal. Thank you. <laughs> like I'm, I'm again, I'm like reliving it as I, as I tell the right, story. Right, so then you can't have any words. And I wasn't. I, <laughs> and I just went into like survival mode and I like bunny hopped it on my gravel bike, you know? Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just did. But it was all like fast. And, yeah, yeah. But that, that was, that, I mean, that's not car sketchy, but that was just. Yeah, and in general, that's not going to happen on there, which is why it was probably surprising because it usually that shoulder's yeah. like clean. It came out of nowhere. Yeah. All right. Um, 
and then time of year, the best time of year oh, to ride it's it. tricky, right? Because the elevation changes so much. Like right now, you and I are going to be pushing it, right? Like mm-hmm. there's still snow out there in the woods. The roads aren't open yet. We're hoping in 10 days it's clear. If we don't get any weather, we're going to be fine. Right. But it's still going to be hot. So it's just, just barely going to open up here. And then we're going to get down to Camp Verde. And it's going to be warm. So the later into the season you push it, the drier it is up here, weather's perfect. And then you go down, it drop down 3,000, 4,000 feet. It's going to be hot. It's very hot. It could so, be like 90 degrees. Yeah. So if someone's heat acclimated, you could do this in the summer. I wouldn't do it in the summer. So late spring and fall are perfect times. Yeah. Fall's probably the best. Yeah. Yep. Fall is, yeah, I did it in October, I think. Yeah. And it was really incredible. Uh, there was wildlife everywhere. There were giant... Uh, gaggles of turkeys, whatever you call groups of turkeys. What do you call groups of turkeys? <laughs> no idea. Gaggles works sure, for now. that works. Yeah. Uh, so, and there was there was elk off in the distance because it was the rut, and it was like you know very um, very active, and all the leaves were changing, and that that blowing across the road on that descent down Perkinsville Road, and it had this like very very distinct fall feeling and it was it was just really nice i like i like that the you know the everything's the the grass is turning brown mm-hmm. and the, the the trees are changing colors and the lighting because the angle of the sun is different like fall is perfect and it's yeah. probably everything's dry you can have a good smooth run that's when i did it with jacob and it was like we pushed it into like winter time and that's why it was so cold but right um it's generally not going to be that cold we just like you know i don't i don't even know why we picked the time we did it It was like oh let's do this thing it's freezing right <laughs> and we went and did it anyway <laughs> Um, but generally I would say late spring, as long as it's dry up here, not too hot down South, uh, you're good. Fall's probably like perfect. Yeah. You know, late August into October. Yeah. Yeah. And summer's too hot down South. I think so. Yeah. I mean, but it, people could do it. I, I, Eddie Bressler and I think, I think we did it in like June. It was pretty damn hot. <laughs> yeah. We did it. Yeah. But he got, he got, you know, heat stroke in Jerome and laid under a tree for a couple hours yeah threw up threw up in the park oh god really <laughs> oh, yeah. oh man yeah shout out eddie yep for, for <laughs> dana made you leaving his, up. <laughs> leave, leaving his dna in the in jerome <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah all right cool yeah we covered the uh the the last question was about mud so i pretty much think we covered it um so yeah uh we probably should get you out of here pretty soon. You got to go back to your day job, right? I got to go, go back to campus and do a review session with the students. You you are a math teacher, math I'm, professor? I'm a math professor, yeah. yeah. Full-fledged math geek. Yeah. Working at Northern Arizona University. Yeah. So, cool. Well, any last thoughts on any anything else on VVR? Thanks, any... thanks for having me on. Yeah. I always like chatting with you. I've enjoyed the podcast you've done so far um i would encourage people if they're interested in doing vvr to just go have a crack at it i i, I think it is a great route clockwise counterclockwise start wherever you want um there's a website if you complete the route in any time one day two days three days four days five days whatever it is if you complete the route under your own power no stash in water no stash in food drafting with a group of people is totally fine but if you complete the route, I've got a pretty cool patch that I'll send to anyone that completes it. Um, just send me proof of passage, and uh, and I'll I'll mail you a patch. Cool. That uh, Wyatt Spalding put together, and it looks great. Cool. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. Thank you for. I, I found a slot of time in your <laughs> life. I want to have you on again after Ride Across Arizona. Cool. And dive into that yeah, a little bit. That'll be a great adventure. Yeah. I'm so I'm I'm looking forward to doing that in a couple of years. It always conflicts with pinions. And so maybe in a couple years, uh, maybe I'll do an ITT or something, but I want to really, um, you, you can be the guinea pig on that. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on and making the time for this. And I cannot wait to start with you. Yes. And we're going to do this thing. We're going to do it. We'll see what kind of trouble we can get into. (laughs) Sounds great. Have an adventure. All right. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, dude.